This happened back when I was in high school. It was summer break, so my friends and I were having a fire at one of their houses. It was getting late, so I was getting ready to drive home before our town's curfew at midnight. My friend Stacy asked if I could give her a ride home instead of having one of her parents come and pick her up. It was out of my way, but I had a bit of a crush on her at the time, so I told her of course. We were on our way to her house and just kind of chatting. We live in a pretty rural area, so there are not any street lights, and if it's late, there's a good chance that you won't see anyone else on the road. I'm not really paying attention to the road, and I make a turn, and a man runs out in front of my truck, waving his arms frantically. I slam on the brakes, almost hitting this guy, and at this point, I should have just kept driving, but thinking that something was wrong, I immediately put my truck in the park and hop out. The man starts asking for help with his car, saying that he broke down and his cell phone is dead, so he can't call anyone. He asked me if I could give him a ride to the nearest gas station so he could make a call. Another car pulls up behind me and stops very close behind my truck. And this is the first time that I actually take a look at my surroundings. It is now almost midnight and this man's car is just nowhere in sight. And he keeps pressing me to help him. And it was at this point that I make my first good decision during this whole situation and begin to back up to my truck as nonchalantly as possible. I jump in and drive off as quickly as possible as this man is now screaming at me. The car that was behind us starts to follow and after a little while I decide to make four right turns and after I feel that they weren't following us I eventually take her home. The road the guy flagged us down on was how I actually got home as well and being afraid to go back down that road I had to go the long way that added a good bit of time to my ride. I didn't get home till well after my parents wanted me back and I explained what happened to my parents the next morning at breakfast and my dad rightfully chewed me out for putting Stacy in that situation. It was a sketchy moment for sure and something that I'll never repeat. I was around 14 years old when this took place. We had just moved to my grandmother's neighborhood like three weeks prior. I was extremely familiar with this place as I'd visited them every weekend. And down the road a bit was a small pond that was in the middle of the next neighborhood over. I would regularly go down there to fish as well as my dad's friend owned the property where the pond was at. He had a very nice house with a little gazebo that protruded out of the water a little bit. He lived right near the small dam at the end of the lake and the dam was about 8 feet high I'd say and on the side that wasn't facing the lake there was a 50 foot concrete slope that went into the woods below. So it was a Friday night in January and me being the avid fisherman I was I was getting ready for a trip down there the next morning. I went to bed kind of early with my dog and fishing buddy Angel. She's a Jack Russell rat terrier mix and I had her since I was about 6 years old. A man's best friend for sure. But once we got into bed, I just couldn't sleep for some reason, and I just kind of tossed and turned. I finally dozed off for about an hour, I suppose, but woke up for no apparent reason again and couldn't go back to sleep. I looked at my phone, and it was about 1.30 in the morning, and after a short thought, I decided to just go down to the pond and start fishing. I grabbed my fishing pole, tackle box, my thermos, and Angel's leash, and we started walking down to the pond. You might think that I was pretty crazy for going fishing in 20 degrees Fahrenheit, but I was really into fishing. And besides, I was having great luck fishing down there at night recently, so I wanted to go and push my luck. It was a short walk to get to the lake, but I had to walk around it to the far side where I fished, which was another half mile or so. It was really foggy that night as well, but I could see pretty well still because it was a full or almost full moon that night. It was extremely quiet too. Usually the road that I was walking on is very busy at all hours, but it was just too cold for anyone to be out that night. We made it to my dad's friend's house and we walked down to the gazebo and I sit my things down and take a drink of hot chocolate before I start getting my line ready for the water. Angel also found a small place in between the wooden benches to lay down. Now, this next part may seem a bit unimportant, but... Please just bear with me because it is. So once I got my fishing pole rigged up, I casted it out and sat it down to wait for a bit. My fishing reel has a setting to where if a fish tugs on the line, it makes a really loud clicking noise to let you know that you have a bite. 
Well, that's the setting that I put it out to, and I set it down and took a look around. It was about 2.30am, give or take at this point. I look over to the left at the houses. I look over to the right towards the dam, which was about 40 feet from where I was. It was still very quiet, and I continued to look around the area, just kind of taking in the moonlit water. But then, suddenly, I see something out of the corner of my eye to my right. There, by the dam, I see a white blob walking on all fours, looking as if it's smelling the ground or something. It looked like a white dog from where I was, and I didn't want Angel to see it, so I picked a leash up and kept an eye on the thing. At this point, I still thought it was a dog, and I wasn't scared in the least bit. But then it made its way up to the wall dam, and then it stood up on two legs, which was when I realized that this was no dog. I crouched down beside the wooden bench where Angel was lying, grabbed her up and faced her away from the creature. The thing didn't see me and I was going to do my damnedest to make sure it never did. I intensively watched it as it looked around the area and then proceeded to jump up onto the 8 foot tall dam effortlessly, almost as if it floated or something. And then it did something really strange. Its pale white skin started glowing almost like a firefly. I could see the bluish colored veins in its back and calf muscles and this thoroughly freaked me out. Then it turned around to where I could see its face. It was about three and a half feet tall, had a short torso, long skinny legs and arms, a wide head, almost oval shaped I suppose, large ears, a large mouth with many small teeth and huge eyes that were yellowish orange in color. And on top of that, I have to repeat that it was glowing. I was nearly hyperventilating trying to control my breathing, hoping that this thing wouldn't hear me. Angel too was now aware of its presence and the hair on her neck stood up as she started growling and struggling to get out of my arms. I kept watching it, terrified to move and it didn't do anything when it got up to the top of the dam. It just kind of squatted down and looked as though it was examining something in its hand. After a few minutes of watching it, I'd worked up the idea to just go back the way I came and once I got to the road, just run as fast as I can home. Angel was growing increasingly aggressive in trying to see the creature, but I kept her buried in my big winter jacket the best that I could. I decided to just leave my stuff there and come back to get it the next day and I slowly stood up and just as I was about to start walking around the gazebo, my fishing pole started making a really loud zing sound. And I mean, of all the times, now I get a fish bite? But my attention went straight back to the creature, which was now frantically looking around for the source of the noise. In my panic, I forgot to keep Angel covered up, and she saw the creature for the first time. She started barking like I've never heard her bark before, as if she was in terror or something. And that, I must admit, scared me. The creature then saw us there and it bent down as if it were about to start running towards us. I tried to take a step back and start running but I slipped on the cold hard ground. I landed on my side and looked at the creature. Thankfully it hadn't started to chase us but it let out the most disturbing scream that I've ever heard. The only way I can describe it is if it sounded like a woman screaming but backwards, if that makes sense. It then jumped from the dam into the woods about 100 feet away and faded as it landed. I'm ashamed to admit that I was in tears now and my fight or flight kicked in. I grabbed Angel and I ran as fast as I could all the way up to the door of my house. Too afraid to look back and see if it was behind me, I eventually got home and I don't really remember what happened till the next day. I must have passed out or something because all I remember is it seeming like a dream. But the next day, I went to go and get my gear from the gazebo, and it all was still there, so it definitely wasn't a dream. I didn't go back to the pond, even during the day, for at least a few years. I told my mum and my dad the story months later, and while they do believe me, I still wonder what that creature actually was. Please let me know your thoughts on this, because honestly, I don't know what to think. Not even half an hour ago, I just had one of the freakiest paranormal experiences that I've had in a, a long time. 
To give you guys some backstory, I live in an apartment attached to a funeral home. I'm a mortuary science student and I work for this funeral home to get experience while I'm in school to be a mortician. The funeral home happened to have a vacant apartment set privately in the back that I just couldn't possibly turn down because I just moved away from home for this school and I needed an inexpensive place to live. But since the day I moved in, I've been having these very notable paranormal experiences. But for a couple of months, I just kept it to myself, not wanting to seem like I was feeding into some spooky funeral home stigma or making it up. But eventually I was experiencing enough that I had to bring it up with a co-worker of mine and she confirmed that she and a few other employees had seen and heard the same things I have. That being said, it's not news to any of us that the place is haunted, if that's what you can call it. So today after I got home from classes and went home I was feeling extremely uneasy. My apartment felt just extra dark and I felt sort of jumpy I suppose. I was standing in my bathroom braiding my hair and one of my co-workers texted me. She said that she has a weird feeling and asks me to go and check the front doors of the funeral home to make sure that they're locked. I read her text as I braided my hair and her next message pops up and it says, I'm 99% sure I locked it but I just have a nagging feeling about something. I tell her that I'd go and check and I finished braiding my hair and slipped on my shoes and walked to the door in my apartment that opens up into the back of the funeral home. The lights are off and I don't bother turning them on as the motion sensor in the hallway always kicks on by themselves. I made my way to the front lobby which was dark, not counting the light through the front door windows. I walked to the front doors and pushed. And sure enough, both of them were unlocked. At that moment, I had a really heavy feeling like someone was behind me or watching me as well. I kept turning around to look, but standing by the light at the doors and looking into the dark lobby made it almost impossible to see. Eventually, I just hurried up and locked the doors and made my way back through the lobby, and as I was about to enter the hallway, I hear a little girl giggling. I stopped dead in my tracks for a moment because just at the end of her giggling, it sounded like it was coming from behind a door not six feet away from me. At this, I got chills on my entire body, and I just hightailed it back into the lit hallway and into my doorway. I locked the door behind me and immediately heard a loud bang from a room in the funeral home. I have no idea what it was, but it was very loud, and I wasn't about to go and check it, that's for sure. As I was standing there, pretty much crapping my pants, I texted my co-worker back saying, the doors were both unlocked. And as I'm typing in my story of what happened, she says, I don't know man, I've been getting weird vibes in there all day. It had been a few weeks since I'd had anything strange happen, but now I was extremely on edge. There are two spirits or entities or whatever you call them that myself as well as three other co-workers have all seen. One of them is of a little girl and she looks maybe 8 years old. She's slightly taller than average and she shows herself so briefly that you wonder if you even saw it. I would almost say that she looks 10 but when we hear her giggle she sounds like a young girl of maybe 6 years old. The other is a tall shadow like man who wears a long black coat and a black hat. And he is an entirely different story. I'm chilled in here right now because some days in here feel just weirder than others and tonight feels like the kind where I probably won't get any sleep. I feel so anxious right now because usually these things happen in waves so I feel like I'm just waiting for the next thing to happen. Anyway, I've been so amazed at all the feedback that I've gotten for this story that I thought that I should share more of what I've experienced here. A lot of people have actually asked me that I share more so... Here's some of them. The very day I moved in, I was trying to clean and dust everything as I was unpacking. I was listening to music and polishing one of my end tables when something caught my eye. I glanced up towards my hallway where the bathroom is located and briefly saw what looked like a little girl peeking at me from behind the door frame. I did a double take, not sure what I was seeing, and when I did, she was gone. I paused my music and kind of stood there with a stupid look on my face, I'm guessing. And then I heard a soft rustling noise from the bathroom, like the sound of maybe the shower curtain or something. I walked over to the bathroom and peeked in, but 
Of course, there was nothing there. My first few nights there were actually pretty normal after that too. Some strange noises like bumps on the wall, knocking and brushing noises, but I attributed all of that to the fact that I was in a new place and those noises were probably normal in the building. One night, though, I was taking a shower, minding my own business, when I felt an ice-cold air on my back. I didn't have the air on at this time, and there were no windows in my bathroom that could cause a draft like that. But I felt immediately uneasy and peeked out behind my shower curtain to see that everything was normal. I went back to showering and tried to pretend like nothing happened. But as I was facing the water, my towel that was draped up over the curtain rod fell to the floor. I jumped and whipped around quickly, peeking behind the curtain again, and nothing. I was pretty shaken though now, and I picked up my towel and draped it back over the rod. I tried to hurry up and finish my shower, but just as I was about to turn off the water, I hear my bathroom door click. In absolute fear and panic, and ready to nakedly fight someone, I ripped off the curtain to see my door slowly opening. I stood there and watched until it slowly reached the doorstop. I said something along the lines of, holy crap, through tears and fumbled for my towel and ran just straight out of my bathroom. I got dressed and left for the rest of the day and didn't come back until about 9 that night. Nothing happened for the rest of that evening and after that, things were pretty quiet for a little while at least. Around two weeks later, it was a little after midnight and I was doing laundry that night. My washer and dryer are in the actual prep room where we embalm people, so to do laundry I'd have to go back into the hallway of the funeral home. I had just put in a load of washing and was walking back to my apartment door at the very end of the hallway when I heard a door latch. Kind of like the door was closed in the frame but not latched if that makes sense. It made me jump and I turned around and at the end of the hallway I saw a really tall shadow man. Now, the owner of the funeral home was a big man who wears a long black coat in the winter and has this thick black cowboy hat sort of thing that he wears. So, for a split second, I thought maybe it was my boss who had come in for something. But, it definitely wasn't. It felt like a good two to three seconds that I watched him cross the end of the hallway and then he just disappeared into thin air, almost as I was focusing on him. I mentioned in my original story that there are motion sensor lights in this hallway and these lights were all on during this encounter. He was tall and really big. He had a hat that was similar to the one my boss wears and was black from completely top to the bottom. Like a really, really opaque shadow. Needless to say, I almost crapped myself again and I bolted back to my apartment and locked the door. I was so scared and just in so much disbelief that I was actually lightheaded and had to sit down. I still didn't mention him or the little girl that I saw to anyone I work with. But one day when I came home from class I noticed my microwave time had changed to military time. I didn't think anything of it and I messed with the settings, switching it back. The next night I was working, cleaning one of the lounges and I noticed that the time on the microwave in there was on military time too. At that point, I honestly figured that maybe there was a power outage that day and when the microwaves kicked back on, they just went wonky and switched to military time. This was until the next day, which was my day off. I slept in and I lounged in my bed for like an hour and one of my best friends called me. We had been talking for about 20 minutes and I was like, alright, I should probably get up and do something, I suppose. And I glanced to see what time it is and... My alarm clock was on military time. Now, my alarm clock is a cheap battery operated alarm that doesn't even plug into a wall. I've had it for about four years and had never seen it switch to military time and I just went silent on the phone and stared at the clock trying to find some sort of logical explanation for this. The microwave kind of made sense at first but then with my alarm clock I just couldn't shake the feeling that it all meant something. It wasn't long after that too is when things got considerably spookier. So probably about three days later I suppose I was coming back home one afternoon from classes. I came right in and threw my keys and my purse onto the kitchen table and then turned my back to the table to plug the sink and start running water to do my dishes. My dishes were being piled up and I swore to myself that I'd do them first thing when I got home. 
Anyway, I was letting the sink fill and turned to get my keys and purse from the kitchen table and put them on the end table by my door, which is where I always place them so I don't forget them while I'm running out the door at like 3am death calls. And my purse was there, but my keys weren't. And I had just come in and threw them on the table. I knew that. It only took a few seconds to get the sink ready, so I knew they just didn't get up and walk away. But bewildered, I started looking under the table and on the floor, patting my pockets trying to find my keys, and I mean, I just put them there. Frustrated though, I go to plop down on my couch and ponder if I'm just going crazy. I have a heavy quilt on my couch, and when I went to lift it up and sit down, right there were my keys. Now, I didn't go anywhere near my couch when I came in. I'm 100% positive that I put my keys on the table next to my purse when I came in, and there was no reason that they should be under that quilt. But that wasn't even the weirdest part. On my key ring, I have my parents' house key and my car key on the main key rings, and a second key ring is attached to that one with my apartment door keys on it. And the key ring with the apartment keys on it was stretched and bent as if someone had tried to rip the key ring straight off the other one. The key rings aren't flimsy bendy ones either. I mean, I could hardly open them enough to lock key rings together when I put them on. And it would have taken some serious force to completely pull open the key ring like that. I actually do have a picture of my keys somewhere in my laptop that I'll try and locate and send to you guys later so that you guys can see what I mean. But anyway, obviously my stomach dropped through my butt when I saw my keys were just all messed up under the blanket like that. I almost didn't even believe if I was seeing it all correctly and I felt like I was going crazy. At this point I was feeling like I should at least vent to someone about what was going on. So a night or two after that I was at a working visitation with an older woman who was worked for the boss for a long time. She's my favorite co-worker as she's easy to talk to and reminds me of my grandma or something like that. And she asked me how I was getting settled in the apartment and if I was enjoying it. I told her how much I loved my apartment, but there were some weird things that just didn't make sense happening. She asked what I meant, and I honestly didn't want to say it because, well, I didn't want her to think that I was crazy or trying to pull the wool over her eyes or something. After my hesitation, I just asked if she thought the funeral home was haunted. She explained to me that she had had some strange experiences here as well as a couple of others that I work with too. They've all heard loud screaming and moaning from time to time in the prep room. They've heard giggling, unexplained doors opening and slamming, etc. But what upset me the most was that she told me about a tall black man with a hat that she had seen in the back hallway a couple of times. And at that point, I word vomited and told her everything that had happened since I moved in. And that was the night that I felt like it was confirmed to me that there was something or things here. I remember I honestly felt like vomiting at one point because I was so scared, but at least I knew that I wasn't crazy, right? Strangely enough, uh, a few weeks after that, nothing really big happened. I mean, sure, I would always hear the strange noises at night. It's not uncommon to hear a door open and close by itself somewhere in the funeral home, and I've also heard people talking, hear cots sliding around on the floor, and the same moans and screams my co-workers have all heard. But this has almost all become normal to me, so although it's freaky, it wasn't bothering me directly and I could live with that. At least for a little while, I suppose. Because, once again, things picked up one day when I was in my bedroom putting clothes away. I was sitting on my floor folding a mountain of laundry when I heard a loud, clear as day sound of a man clearing his throat in my living room. The kind that you'd hear when you try to get someone's attention. It was so clear and real that I honestly didn't even think it was a ghost at first. I was confused for a moment thinking that maybe my boss had come in to speak to me, but surely he'd knock. I mean, nobody would ever just walk in here. So I hopped up and stepped into my living room and, as you can guess, there was nobody there. I peered around the corner to see if anyone was in my bathroom, but there was no one. The realization eventually set in that I was alone and my stomach sort of dropped at that point. 
but honestly, I was so used to so much activity that after a few minutes of pacing around in disbelief, I just kind of shook it off and went back to folding laundry. In the most recent weeks, the most I've experienced are the normal sounds and voices and bumps in the night that I always hear. But one night though, a couple of random lights in my TV all shut off at once unexpectedly and I had to go into the funeral home utility room to flip the switches in the breaker box. I notice that when I have someone over and start telling them about these things, the lights or the TV will just shut off. A friend of mine has actually experienced this with me on three different occasions in fact. And that pretty much catches me up to the original story that I shared with you guys. I'm not gonna lie guys, it's been an absolute ride being here. Some nights it's nothing and other nights I sleep with the blankets over my head. I really appreciate you guys taking the time to listen to this. It actually sort of feels therapeutic to share it with all of you guys and I never guessed that so many people would be interested in my story. And so, thank you to everyone for being so cool and listening, even if you don't believe. This is a bit of a weird one and I doubt anyone will believe this and you know that's fine but an incident in a barn made the story real for a lot of people. Anyway, about five years after we built our house I started seeing things in the basement. I'd see small creatures peeking out from behind furniture and once even had a bat fly directly out of the bathroom at my face and then just disappear in mid-flight. But then the guy showed up. I don't remember the first time I saw him, but I remember I'd walk into the basement at night and he'd just be there in the corner. He was really tall, very white, dressed in a longish coat and a black hat. He was sometimes holding what I think was a lantern. Basically, he looked like if a normal, very pale person put on the Batadook's clothes. He never did anything, he just kind of stood there and looked at you with this really serious and morose expression and then faded away into nothing or would disappear if you blinked or looked away. I never really told anyone other than my mum who is a firm believer in the paranormal, much more so than even me. But well, this one night my punk band practiced in the garage and we were all like 14 or 15 maybe. My drummer was sleeping over and my parents were at a casino for the night where we crashed out on opposite sides of the wraparound couch in the basement after playing some video games and then I woke up at around 3am and the drummer was gone. The back doors going into the backyard were wide open and all of the lights were on. I was obviously pretty freaked out. I looked over all the house and I couldn't find him anywhere but then I noticed my new flip phone had moved. Sure enough there was a call to a number that I didn't recognize. I figured that he must have gotten sick or something and had his parents come to get him. The next day I called him and he just was losing his mind. Apparently he woke up, saw the tall guy in the corner, but said the guy put his arms out and lunged at him. He grabbed my phone, ran outside and called his mum to pick him up. He came back in once a lot of lights were back on and put my phone back and then ran out and didn't even close the doors. So... Now it got around school that my house is haunted. But fast forward a few years though and the elderly lady who lived across the street had passed away and the family were doing showings of the house to try and sell it. They had a huge barn behind the house as well as a field and this family went into the barn and their little girl, maybe five or seven, pointed to a corner of the barn and described the exact guy from my basement. She apparently could see him, but nobody else could. She had never been on the property before, yet she saw the exact same thing. And that was the last that I ever heard or saw of him again. This was about two years ago, so I was around 16 or 17. It should also be noted too that I'm a 5 foot tall girl and my twin sister is just 2 inches taller than me so we're relatively small. It was a weekend night and my sister and I were left alone since my mom and stepdad and little brother left to go to a party. My sister was in her room and I was in the living room watching TV so I'm right next to the front door. I hear a knock about a minute after my family had just left and I go to open it since I assume my family may have forgotten something important and return to go and get whatever item it was. 
Now, because I am small, I actually can't peek through the peephole, even on tippy toes. If I look through the blinds, though, whoever is outside would be able to tell because we have those wooden blinds where all of them shift to whichever direction if you move one. But I didn't think about doing either of those things since I did think it was a family member, so when I opened the door, there was a woman there. I didn't know her and she seemed to be in her early 20s, had dark hair and was a bit taller than me and my sister but that was all I could make out since we didn't have the light at our front door and just the moonlight that was barely there. She proceeded to ask if there was a certain someone that lived here and I told her no because I knew no one of that name. The whole thing was a bit creepy I must admit. She wore dark clothing, she spoke in a really low voice and kept looking at the screen door handle as if she was waiting for me to open it. I was thankful that that separated us and she said her goodbyes and left and I closed and locked the doors. I decided to go to the other side of my house where the lights were off and she wouldn't be able to see if I opened the blinds of that window and I see her in the driveway just looking at my house while on the phone with someone. Stayed there for a good three minutes after the call ended and then she just left. Okay, I was creeped out and I told my little sister who watched TV with me in the living room after that. About 15 minutes go by and we hear a knock on the window. We got scared until we heard my aunt's voice so we opened the door. She came to return something I believe and noticed how spooked we were so we told her what happened and she told us to get in her car and we'll get to Starbucks to make us feel better. Sure enough, it did the trick and she dropped us off at our house and didn't leave for about five minutes until we got the house and everything locked up. And then, soon after that, she left. Another knock was heard about three minutes later and I assumed my aunt realized that she forgot to give back whatever item she originally was going to drop off and I opened the door without even checking who it was and standing in front of me was this huge guy. He was at least 6 foot 4 and maybe like 250 pounds. And just overall I knew that he would 100% be able to take me and my sister down without a fight. No sweat. He asked for the same man the woman earlier asked for and I told him that I don't know who that is and he didn't live here. He also looked at the screen door handle as if he were waiting for me to open it as well and, and just left. My sister and I were pretty terrified because there was no way that that was a coincidence. I look out through the blinds again and in the middle of the driveway between our cars, I saw the man talking to the same woman who was here earlier. But they talked for five minutes and went walking to their car which was parked all the way on the other side of the road and two houses down. And it was creepy because we had plenty of parking space in front of or near our house. My sister and I triple checked every door and window was locked, put our dog inside and just waited for our family to come home soon. My family soon came home from the party and we told them what happened more in depth. We had actually called them after the guy came but party was about an hour away without all the traffic so there wasn't much that they could do. They were creeped out as well though and my sister and my stepdad are certain that whoever used to live in our house was some sort of a drug dealer or something illegal like that and he has some people very angry at him and have come to our house thinking that he still lives there but also believe that maybe they were a part of whatever the guy did and won't hesitate to come after us. It's been this way ever since we moved in about four years ago. Strange people just arriving at our house and weird occurrences and hearing weird things. Anyway, everything seems to have calmed down a bit for at least a little while here, so I guess we'll just see how it goes. The year is 2016 and it's the last day of school. After school, which ended at around 12am, my mother, brother, stepdad and I left for the south of France. My stepdad had a vacation home there, so we left around 2pm and braced ourselves for a really long drive. I was cheery though, and so was everyone in the car. We listened to music and played some road trip games, kind of like those ones where you need to come up with the name of an animal, which should start with the last letter of an animal used by the previous person. You get what I mean, just stupid little games. By the way though, we're five hours into the drive, about halfway in I'd say, and we're having dinner in a busy parking lot when suddenly my mother receives a phone call. My mother asks who's on the phone since the number calling her was one she didn't recognize. 
and a French speaking woman on the other side of the phone told my mother that she had a present for her and that she wanted to know our own current address. The woman claimed to have tried to drop it off at our old address since she thought that my mother still lived there but the new owners told her that my mother had actually moved and that they couldn't help the woman. It wasn't even our former address too, but our former former one since we moved two times on a short span of time. My mother, who wasn't very attentive because she was so relaxed and enjoying the trip, unknowingly gave away our then current address. After ending the call though, she explained to my stepdad, my brother and I what the call was about, and we instantly started asking questions. I mean, why would a person have a present for her? How did she get my mother's number? And why would she ask about our address? And why did the woman speak French even though they don't speak French where we live? And it was at this point that my mother's face turned pale and so did mine. We were all really creeped out and obviously nervous. My mother had given this woman our address. We were hundreds of kilometers away from our house and we just couldn't do anything. After dinner, my mother went to recharge her phone inside the building that stood next to the parking lot. And it wasn't even a parking lot, more like a stop for tourists, but the building had shops and restaurants in it. And it was there that my mother reached out to the people who bought our former former house. But they confirmed too that a few hours before my mother called them, a woman did indeed come by and ask them about my mother. And they also said that this wasn't someone that worked for a delivery service or anything. According to the people that my mother had called, the woman didn't have a specialized vehicle with a logo on it, nor did she wear any kind of uniform. The woman was also older, but not that old, but they estimated her to be in her late 40s. My mother also asked them if they had given this woman a phone number, which they didn't. My mother ended the call, and we had even more questions now. At this point, all of us were severely creeped out, though. We got back into the car and continued our drive, and this part, however, wasn't as cheerful and carefree as the first one. All four of us had a discussion on what we should do next, and even why my mother went as far as actually giving our address to this person. My stepdad called our neighbor and asked him to keep an eye on our property, but our house was on the top of a hill and it was rather isolated. Our neighbor had to go over to our house and circle around the property a couple of times and at this point it was also getting pretty dark so it was hard to see. My mother called one of our close friends to go and take a look at our home and I could hear the stress in her voice as she called him. That friend did go over after he received the call and he drove to our home. He said that when he arrived the porch looked normal and that all the lights in our house appeared to be out. My mother's friend and her neighbor actually ran into one another and both scared the crap out of each other, but once they both came to the conclusion that it was safe, they both just went back home. After a while though, our neighbor texted my stepdad that he mentioned what happened to his son, who happened to be a policeman. He informed his colleagues, who were doing a nighttime patrol in our neighborhood anyway, and they said they'd check every few hours just to see what was going on. The police never saw anyone break in that night, but... They did say that around 11.30 at night, they saw a car drive onto the road that led to our house. Now, no one would ever drive down this driveway, unless they were visiting and besides the handful amount of the people who lived there. And according to the people who patrolled around our neighborhood that night, though the car didn't stay long and they never saw anyone get out of it, the car did actually show up. I'm really glad we didn't think about what happened all vacation long because that would have been a total downer, but still, the whole situation was just really weird and kind of sketchy. We never did hear anything from this woman again and we didn't receive any presents. I'm also very glad that we moved out later that year because who knows who that person was and what they wanted. I work in a care home, a very, very posh one in fact. It costs about £1,200 per week to live here, so as you can imagine, very posh. It has two floors and four suites, two on each floor and either side of the building, and it's very large. Tonight I've been working downstairs and I am not a fan of downstairs. I was in the kitchen ad on one of the suites. One of our jobs is to clean the kitchens as during the day the cleaners can't do it because of safety risks and whatnot. I had my back to the door and I had this weird feeling that someone was in the doorway or was walking to and from one end of the wall or whatever. I don't know how to describe it but it was a weird feeling. 
I was putting cutlery away and I felt as if someone had just very, very gently pushed up against my back and I could feel my uniform move. I turn around and expect to see my co-worker, but nothing. It's just me alone in a big dining room or kitchenette and the lights in the hallway were off. And the rest of the time that I was in there, it felt like someone was literally stood right behind me watching me work and I did not like that at all. I also had an odd experience down at the other end of the building in the other suite too. I was in the kitchenette dining room and I'd been cleaning. I had my back to the door which was on the very end of the dining room and very, very loudly someone began to whistle a nursery rhyme in the corridor. Everyone was asleep though. No alarms had gone off to say someone had gotten out of bed as well. The other member of the staff was having a cigarette outside so it was just me downstairs. I asked another colleague and she said that she's heard the whistling down there before but everyone's asleep at midnight and no one down there can actually whistle anyway. I do get an odd feeling here on the ground floor but it's always around midnight to 3am. It constantly feels like just somebody else is running up and down the corridors or rushing around you. It makes you feel kind of dizzy and sick sometimes too. Sorry about my rambling, but this helps me keep awake on these shifts and I just thought it would be something good to share and to get ideas. Especially because some of the day staff even say that this place creeps them out too. And that is during the day. This happened to me when I was about 12 or 13 I'd say. And I had somewhat forgotten about it until recently. So one day I was walking home from school when I noticed that I had a voicemail on my phone. This was strange because I would never get voicemails but I thought that perhaps it was just someone who had left a blank message after staying on the call for too long or something. I put my headphones in as I plodded along and listened to the voicemail and it was blank. But it went on for quite some time like someone had wanted to say something but just ended up hanging up. So, that's just what I thought, an accident. Later that night, as I was enchanted by my phone, I got another voicemail though. I thought that this was strange as I never got a call in the first place, so I listened once again and once again it was blank. However, you could tell someone was there holding the phone up to their face. This seemed to go on for weeks too and it seemed to get worse day by day. I would come out of school and end up having like six voicemails. I would listen to the first five seconds and delete them if they hadn't said anything by then and at this point I started to get a little bit paranoid. My childlike brain conjuring up the worst thoughts. One of my friends may have been playing a prank on me and I thought it was getting annoying. I asked around and everyone denied it. But I was certain that I would catch them. Until a week later that is. I can't exactly remember what this voicemail was about, but I do remember it sounded like a grown man who was extremely angry. He would call me all sorts of names, and I was stupid because I didn't tell anyone. I was embarrassed, and I began questioning myself had I done something wrong. But day after day, I would get threats, to the point where I no longer wanted to go to school. I didn't even want to leave my house. The last voicemail was once again this man yelling too, heavily breathing, and then he said something that made my head spin. I'm coming to get you. I remember sitting with my back against my bedroom door as if someone was about to kick it down right there and then. I ran into my parents' room and told them that I needed a new number because I was getting weird voicemails. I told them that I deleted them all and that it was bothering me, but obviously they had the wrong number. And so I got a new number and no more voicemails. A couple of days and nothing and I decided that I wanted to go and see my friends at our hangout. We were all a bunch of goth kids and this was the one spot where everyone would be. Even then I tended to stick out though because I was already wearing heavy makeup and had teased hair and you could probably spot me from a mile off if I'm being honest. So I get on the train when a man starts to walk the full distance down just to come up to me. He says hi and then said that he liked my style. I felt like I knew him from somewhere because something just felt similar about him but I just couldn't place it where it was from. And that was when the question started. How old are you? I'm 29. Oh you're 13 right? I hadn't answered but I thought that he was just quirky and guessing so I said yes. 
He said, where do you go to school? Oh, you go here, right? But once again, I hadn't even answered and I felt odd. I just lied though when I told him that I used to go there, but I'd be going to a different school now. And then he said, so where are you going today? Are you seeing anyone? And I said that I was meeting a bunch of friends, but didn't answer the where I was going part. I started to look away. I no longer wanted to make eye contact with him. He ducks, like straight up bends over and tilts his head just to make eye contact with me. I look a different direction and he steps right in front of me, forcing me to look at him again. It wasn't even his body, he just kind of moved his face to wherever my eyes would go. I wasn't even speaking now and it was just a blur of him asking me questions and then answering them himself. He seemed to know everything about me, even all the stores or areas I had visited in the past month. Adults all around me start to stare and he seems to panic. And then he says, there's a party going on at the library, wanna come? Obviously, I decline and he gets off. I later found out too that near this library are the dingiest alleyways and car parks probably in the entire city. But months pass and I hear nothing. A trend goes around about YouTubers googling their names and seeing what pops up though and I decided it would be fun to do that myself so I go ahead and I google my username that I used online back then expecting to see nothing just a bunch of junk on the web pages. So I go into images and see a few months of old selfies of me and I click on it and it leads to a website that I didn't know. The photo doesn't appear to be on the site and its layout looks incredibly old. All there is is my username and then a download link called Map. I didn't want to download it in case there was some sort of tracking virus on it or something and well that's what I first thought of when I first saw it. I panicked, closed everything, and nothing seemed to happen ever again. I also happened to get some homeschooling after this as well, which did help. It was a very bizarre thing that happened to me, and I still don't know really what to make of it. And I still wonder what was on that file to this day. Four years ago, me and my best friend decided to go to a tiny house in the woods that her grandpa owned and stay for a few days. The place was completely isolated, the road was really far away, and there were barely any houses around. But when we used to take walks during the daytime, the first house that we saw was 30 minutes away, in fact, from the one that we were currently staying in. Her grandparents' house was a one-story only. There was one tiny bathroom, and the kitchen was in the living area and one bedroom. So, but one night I asked her to keep me company while I smoke a cigarette outside on the gazebo. She agreed and before we went outside, we looked the front door even though the gazebo was right next to the house and we could easily see if someone tried to get inside. We stayed a little longer outside because we got carried away in our conversation when all of a sudden we hear something hit the roof of the gazebo loudly. It was so loud that it honestly sounded like a body just fell from the sky and onto the roof. We obviously froze and none of us would even dare to breathe. We just kind of looked at each other. I know that my best friend in these types of situations goes into full panic mode, screaming and running, so before she even managed to scream, I told her quietly to not make a sound and just grab a phone and go inside the house. We get up and walk away from the gazebo to the front door and I look to see if there's something up there, but there's nothing. But we get to the front door and guess what? The door is open, almost halfway open. At this point, my best friend starts jumping around and making sounds and tries to dial her grandpa. But I mean, what the hell is that poor man even going to do? It's a two hour drive from where he is. He didn't pick up at first, so I finally managed to convince my best friend to just go inside and look around to see if someone's in the house. As I previously mentioned though, the place is really small, so we managed to search the whole place in like under a minute. And there was nobody in the house. There's also only one window in the house, which is in the bedroom, and it's high up and it was closed. Her grandpa finally called back and we told him what happened, and he said that we probably didn't lock the front door properly, but he didn't mention anything about the loud thump on the roof of the gazebo. To this day, I still have no clue what that was. We didn't sleep the whole night and all the lights in the house were on because we didn't dare spend a second in the dark after what happened. 
Also, just to be clear, there are no mountain lions here, and there's maybe some wolves and foxes, but it's extremely rare. And I also have never seen either of them outside with my own two eyes, so it's very unlikely that it was them. As for tree branches, there wasn't anything on top of the roof, which is a straight horizontal roof. It's not that high too, so it can easily be checked and no sound of anything hitting the ground afterwards, so that was weird. Also, it definitely wasn't snow because it was the beginning of September. A few people have said that it might be a person trying to scare us and this is the thing that terrifies me the most. Because around us are nothing but dark woods and as I've mentioned previously, the place is really isolated. I would like a logical explanation for all of this, but the more I think about it and read, the more terrified I am. When I was a kid, my parents ended up fostering my cousins named Jay and R, aged 4 and 5, and at the time I believe I was about 10, and they shared a room with me. They brought about a couple of uh, weird experiences. I had the top bunk and they shared the bottom bunk. They were used to getting up super early for their mum's doctor's appointment, so they would wake up around 6am and play on the bottom bunk. But They annoyed me to no end, so I would just pretend to sleep through it. Our closet door was about two feet from the foot of the bed, and one morning, it just cracked open all on its own. It must have squeaked or something, because they stopped playing when it happened. After a few seconds, it shut again then opened, then shut. It did that a few times rather slowly, and then it just slammed shut and there was pounding on the door from the inside. After about five seconds, it went all quiet again. I climbed down over the side of the bed to avoid going close to the closet, and ushered the girls out of the room, not really knowing what to do because everyone else was asleep and I knew my parents wouldn't believe me if I woke them up over this. Then Jay became upset because her toys were kept in the closet and she was worried about them. I tried to hold her back, but she ran in and threw the closet door open. There was nothing out of the ordinary, and all of our clothes were hanging up, the toy bins were closed, and nothing else. My mum to this day still doesn't believe me. Jay always seemed to be the one the weird stuff surrounded, but they're in another state with their mum now, and might be moving back soon, and I really want to see if they remember anything. This story takes place over a number of years. In late January this year is when the event actually occurred, but let me start from where this began. Maybe about two years ago, I just randomly started getting dreams about a dude in a straitjacket running into my basement room and screaming at me. This dream would occur once every few months and made me really unnerved, as you can probably imagine. I have a pet dog, and one night both him and I heard thumping coming from the stairs and close to my room. My dog started growling and eventually started to bark, but there was nothing there. A few more months pass and I have the dreams more often and eventually it happens. It was a late Sunday afternoon in January of this year. I was playing Bullet Storm on the PS4 in my basement while my dog is sleeping with me. When out of nowhere I hear the footsteps again in rapid succession down my stairs. My dad was home at the time, so I called out to him, but the steps continued, right into my room, and then into my left ear, I hear this huge scream. My dog immediately freaked out and ran upstairs, and I asked my dad if he had heard the noise, but he said no. I really don't know what's going on in this house, but it's pretty freaky, so any suggestions are very much appreciated. When I was in middle school, there was this one stairwell, stairwell A, in the 6th grade hallway that was usually pretty empty. I would only see a few kids take that way up and our school had four stairwells, two in the 6th grade hallway and the other two in the 7th and the 8th grade hallway. Even when class got out though, it seemed everyone would just avoid stairwell A. I've only taken it three times while I was at that school, and as soon as you opened the big double doors, there was this really large vent that always had dust caked all over its large grate. I figured that the janitors just never paid it any mind. Strangely enough though, stairwell A was pretty much clean unlike the rest. The other stairwells were always littered with food, wrappers, and gum, and you name it. 
The vent was big enough to crawl into, so students crawled into it from time to time into the crawl space. There was a rumor going around too that a young boy ran into some bullies on the last day of school sometime in the 70s. Apparently, they took him and forced him into the crawl space and locked him in there and just left him there crying for someone to help. All the teachers had left and there were no cameras, so allegedly he died and rotted there, potentially becoming rat food. Obviously, I didn't believe any of that, but I did always get an eerie cold feeling when I took that stairwell, even before I heard that rumor. Now, the last time I took stairwell A was when I was making my way to my third period English class. I was on the first set of the stairs, almost to the middle of the stairwell, before you would take a turn to the next set of stairs. I dropped one of my pens that was tucked into one of my binder pockets. I bent down to pick it up. Mind you, I was completely alone. And then suddenly, I heard one super loud shake like a metal grate was being tried violently or something. It came from the direction of the crawl space, and I jumped so hard that I almost ran from it straight away. But instead, I looked at the crawl space quickly to see if someone was playing a joke on me, but when I did, nobody was there. I got onto the stairs, and once I got to the third step, the shaking happened again, but louder, and I thoroughly freaked the hell out at this point, and ran up the stairs as fast as I could. I don't know what it was. I don't believe in the rumor, but... I knew then why kids avoided this stairwell, eh? And from then on, I did too. Once, I was walking home with a friend on one of the trails around our town. We were almost to the end of the trail, and I could see the road and the sidewalk ahead lit up by the streetlight. It was around 11pm or so, and we were just chatting about some stupid things that had happened at school that Friday morning. I was looking ahead the whole time, and... I saw movement straight ahead of us. I paused and stopped walking. I thought maybe it was a deer, but it seemed much larger. And my friend looked at me estranged and asked what was wrong. I told her that I thought I saw something, and she told me to stop freaking her out, so we just kind of laughed it off and continued. About ten seconds later, though, we were almost to the sidewalk, and clear as day, out of the trees and the bushes came this really, really tall, dark silhouette of what looked like a man with deer antlers on his head. My eyes were watery, and I could feel the heat of my body spread in an instant. My adrenaline was pumping, and I just stood there and just kind of watched as it just silently glided across the trail into the patch of woods on the other side. I just remember saying, what? And looking at my friend. The figure had no legs. It was just a straight rectangular body and a head with what looked like antlers of some sort. My guess is that it was at least eight feet tall from where we were. My friend just looked at me with the most disturbing look on her face. And at this point, we decided to ball up and just run for the sidewalk and then straight home. When I was a child, I lived on Rhode Island in a small, predominantly Portuguese neighborhood where most every family knew the members of every other family. I would spend almost every day at my grandmother's house because my father worked two jobs and my mother was a nurse, so grandma did most of the child raising for them. Now, the layout of the house is important here. She had a fairly large house, big front yard, and a long straight driveway running along the right side of the house with a small gate. From the side driveway, there were a few steps into a small, like, alcove with a door that I would use to get inside. The side door was my grandmother's preferred way that people come in and out of her house, because she was super particular about caring for the garden out front. I used to play with RC cars in the driveway, or just run around and be a little idiot, as children tend to do, and one day, a large brown van parked in front of the house while I was outside playing with my RC cars. Grandma was inside in the kitchen, which was situated at the back of the house facing the backyard, so she didn't really know what was happening. I remember a lot of details about this van too. It was huge, it looked like a van you'd see in a 70s movie or something, but the paint was all chipped. It didn't look good at all, it was rusty and beat up. It was filled to the brim with stuff. It had a lot in it too, and I distinctly remember a blonde-haired, pink-faced doll that was so clustered in with other junk that it was pressed right against the glass of the van. There were other plush toys too, but that doll stuck out to me because I had a morbid fear of dolls at the time. 
My grandmother had porcelain dolls and my dad had taken to scaring the crap out of me with child's play, so dolls equaled bad at the time. And that probably saved my life to be honest. There was a man in the front and I couldn't see his details very well. The car turned off and he just sat there, staring at me. He motioned for me to come to him and I approached the van but as soon as I caught sight of that doll... I just booked it inside and I left my toys out there and ran into the kitchen screaming and crying. I almost knocked over everything she was cooking in fact and I was just completely hysterical. All I can remember screaming is a man is out there, a man is out there over and over again. She picked me up and went outside and when we were there the van was gone. There was no evidence of anything. My toys were untouched and she picked them up for me and just kept me inside all day and said that I wasn't allowed to go outside. I don't think she ever did tell my mum though because up until I left home for college I refused to go outside alone and my mum always thought that it was weird that I did it. Now... I'm not the one to really share their paranormal experiences with others super often, but sometimes there's just a point where it becomes too much to not say anything. I'm no stranger to the paranormal and I'm a believer in it, but these recent experiences make me feel uneasy just thinking of them, let alone experiencing them. I try to stay upbeat and be the funny guy in most circles, but I feel as if this needs to get out there. So, just some quick backstory before I begin. My girlfriend got kicked out of her house and my parents took her in with us. I'm 19 and she's 18. My dad has also been quitting smoking and has more or less replaced it with drinking, causing a lot more fights between my parents than usual. My girlfriend and I both believe the negative energy is probably the main reason that these things have come to our house. So, it started a few weeks ago. My girlfriend and I were just relaxing in our room when suddenly she asks, do you feel that? I of course was confused as to what she meant and she quickly alluded to the entity in the hallway. I know my girlfriend and she can be spooked easily but it's never without justification. As soon as she said something I just got this weird feeling in my lower back telling me that something was very wrong. I don't know why, but that's just the area that I feel a lot of pressure on whenever there's something around me. She realized that I could feel it too, and she turned to me and said, It's so dark. She then proceeded to tell me about how when she took a shower earlier that day, the towel was thrown off the bar that she kept it on and into the shower with her. After that, we went out to the kitchen to make some food where the conversation about what happened continued. She told me that she didn't want to sound crazy to me because she was scared of chasing me off with how weird it was, but she claimed that she could feel the presence of different things. She also then proceeded to exclaim that there were six different things at our house and all of them were dark. We quickly realized that we were out of pasta and what we were craving that night, so we went to get some at the grocery store and we both got this really uneasy feeling that something was in our back seat. I could easily brush it off as me or her being paranoid, but we both felt it, and we both felt it follow us into the store as well. And as we were driving home, I looked in the rearview mirror, and I swear to you that something was there. It was a dark shadow, and it kind of just stared at me, I think. I turned around and said, what's that? And so did my girlfriend when I said that, and when we looked, there was nothing there. As we were getting close to my house though, something began to shake the back of my chair. We both immediately jumped out of the car and ran to the front door of the house and when we got inside we were both just freaking. We sat up that night talking and we didn't get much sleep and to be honest, I really don't know what to do now. I woke up to something last night and it sounded like my front door had been slammed shut. Initially, I thought it was a dream, as I'm a very vivid dreamer, but I'm certain that this was not the case. I don't remember what I was dreaming of, but when the door slammed shut, I was hurled into reality. Immediately, I scanned the room, trying to determine if this was in fact reality or just another weird dream. But then I saw my cat frozen in fear. His hair stood up like I had never seen before. His muscles flexed his deep claws into my thigh and his back arched in a primal defense. 
and this terrified me. I knew that if he was truly scared that I had a real reason to be as well because I've always been told that animals can sense danger long before humans can. Finally, I examined the door and I noticed that it swayed slowly like it was breathing almost, like someone was standing on the other side trying to determine if I was still asleep. And then I could just barely see the silhouette of a man through the light of the cracked bedroom door. I held my breath as the door continued to breathe. I could literally hear my heart pumping its blood through my arteries, telling me to run, but I just refused to move, frozen now. I was completely paralyzed in fear, and I laid naked for many minutes watching the door, anticipating someone would burst through it. It felt like an eternity, but in this moment, my auditory senses were amplified. It was like my body just knew that this was a life or death situation, and it was scraping every last effort to increase my odds of survival. After the initial silence, I began to hear creaks outside my door like someone was trying hard to move through my living room without awakening me. At this point, I knew I had no gun and no roommate in the house. I considered yelling in an attempt to frighten them away, but I was terrified that someone might respond. I legitimately thought that this was the moment where I would kill or be killed. I don't know how much longer I laid in bed, but eventually I mustered up the courage to check out every room in the house. I wielded the only defense that I had, which was my roommate's hot pink taser, and I checked every corner and closet, but I found no one. I still don't know what happened that night, but I'm certain my body was kicked into an evolutionary state because I and my cat truly believe that someone was inside my house. I grew up in a small California desert tourist town called Joshua Tree. It was home of the Joshua Tree National Park. Those of us who are older called it the monument as it was that before National Park Day. I was in my early 20s at the time of this, which was approximately 14 years ago, I'd say, and was the only one with a car and a license. Growing up in a small desert town leaves you with limited options for fun, and we would make use of the park often. Occasionally, maybe once a week or so, a group of us would pile into the station wagon with beer, smokes, and a mixtape, and drive through the park late at night. It was an empty road, really dark and quiet, other than the loud group of guys in the red Mercury driving fast from one entrance to another. But hours go by each time as we drove the long desolate road and stopped at various rocks we liked to climb. And for the life of me, I still can't understand just how desolate it was, how alone, and there were no other cars, no lights, except the occasional roadwork sign when warranted. And hell is exactly what we thought it was at the time. So this trip started out like pretty much every other, except maybe more of us than usual, I suppose. But we were crammed in that car, windows down as I chain smoked and drove a good 20 miles per hour over the speed limit, gravel splitting up as we had a good time, and shortly into the trip I saw a light, a blue light. It was possibly miles and miles ahead, I'm really not too sure, but I guess that's the thing about the dark, right? Light is free to just kind of shine for miles. I remember saying to my friend something about having to slow down at some point ahead. Must be some road construction left by itself up ahead. I assume that it had to be a sign. I mean, the light hadn't moved. But we continued for a few miles to one of our favorite stops and got out though. We climbed for a while, maybe 45 minutes or so. Drank a little and joked, the norm, and then we piled back in and continued. Now, let me be clear that this light never moved and we had already been out for an hour in our adventure. And I began to question, too, why the sign would have a blue light of all things. As we approached the light, I started to slow and slowed more and more as we approached the source. And it wasn't a sign and it wasn't a car. It wasn't a UFO. Because standing on the side of the road, facing towards us, unmoving for over an hour at this point, was a man. A pale white man with a white beard, dirty old miner clothing with an old mining helmet and even a pickaxe. His light was giving off an unnatural blue light. His face was blank, but he just kind of stared at us, directly at all of us. We sped up at this point as we drove by faster, his head turning to keep pace with us as we left his light visible, unmoving once again and facing us the entire trip out. I remember looking at the car clock shortly after passing him. 
It was damn near exactly 1am when we passed him and we never saw a car or hell even a horse. Either way as well for this old sickly pale miner to get into the park. Nor any reason for him to even be there. Worst of all though, we estimated that this miner had to have been standing there facing us for at least an hour and a half never moving. I mean, not once did that light flicker as if he looked down for a moment or anything. He didn't even turn his head. He just stood there staring down at a road at a car full of dumbasses. We never did see him again, nor did we ever get an explanation as to why he was there or who he was. However, a couple of years ago, I decided to check to see if anyone else experienced the same thing. And I found one of the story of a couple that saw him near where we did, standing there, just staring late at night. I must admit that as a man now, I wish I would have stopped. Even if we would have experienced the most horrifying thing ever, I do wish we would have stopped because I honestly believe that there was a ghost of an old dead miner out in that park and I would know for sure today. So, I just want to communicate with others about this and hear your thoughts as well, because I have to admit that I'm a bit shaken up. I'm looking after my friend's three little girls tonight while she works on an overnight shift. Technically, it was last night as it's now 2.30 in the morning. Also, it's officially my 28th birthday and it's one for the books, let me tell you. So the girls are ages 5, 6 and 8 and my friend has a very long history of paranormal activity that started when she was a kid and now her children are starting to have some experiences and they're honestly just scared half to death. The 5 year old was going on about her imaginary friend Summer tonight who she's been talking about since she was 2. She says that Summer isn't really imaginary, she's real, she's just not alive. She describes her the exact same way every single time as well and says that she likes wood. I have no idea why. My friend's daughter doesn't have an explanation for the wood thing either, which is weird. Anyway, she was talking to me about it tonight and said that she hasn't seen Summer in a long time and she's missing her and blah blah blah. Her older sister, 8, doesn't like to hear it because it freaks her out. I got them off the subject and played guitar for them and all was well for a, a few hours. Then the five-year-old looks out the window leading to the balcony and says that she sees a ghost. I, of course, just shrug it off, thinking it's just in her mind. The six-year-old walks up to the window, turns around and looks me dead in the eyes with a look of horror that I've never seen on such a young child. The eight-year-old looks out the window and totally freezes. And so, I'm over here like, guys, you're getting yourselves worked up. And then I look out the window, and the expression, you look like you've seen a ghost, is exactly what I think my face looked like. Because I was frozen. It was standing on the balcony across from us, and it was massive. Like a giant, almost. If that was just a person, they're the largest person on the planet, that's for sure. They were that big. I told the girls to back away quickly and I went outside and I couldn't really see much of the face, just the figure and you could tell though that it was staring at us. Eight year old comes back over and I make up some story about shadows and stuff and she's like, no, it's moving. And it was. It moved its arm and head in the most unnatural way that I've ever seen. Everything was just so wrong about it. My stomach was in knots and I got the girls to go into the living room and went into mum mode as they are my priority and I didn't have a second to worry about anything else. After they chilled I kept going back to the window and there it was, staring and moving its limbs just a little bit. Eventually after quite some time they fell asleep on the couch while watching a movie and I snuck back out to check on things and it's gone. It was just gone. I have no other way to say it. I must admit that sharing this with you guys just makes me feel so crazy and I wish I had another adult with me to confirm what I saw but I know what I saw and it was there. There's no way it could have just been a neighbor or something. No way. It was way too big to be human and it moved in a way that I've never seen a human move. It honestly sent just chills down my spine and really creeped me out. 
The six-year-old woke up scared and is in the master bedroom sleeping now and I'm sitting on this balcony staring at the balcony across from me just waiting for this thing to reappear and so far there's nothing. When nothing else happened and nothing else needed to happen, I know what I saw and it was like nothing that I've ever seen in my life. At this point, I know I'm going to be up all night. It made me so uncomfortable and more importantly, I want to be aware of everything so I can protect the kids. I don't know, I, I feel just kind of crazy right now. If anyone can shed some light or just relate, that would be really good. Better yet, if you've seen a giant ghost, I'd sure love to know that I'm not alone. Also, my friend came home early from work and I haven't slept a wink. She's very, very scared and I left out many details in my state of panic, but this one in particular is probably important. So, the eight-year-old, before we saw the figure, actually heard her mum's voice, who was at work at the time, coming from her sister's room. I thought that I heard it too, but I didn't want to freak her out, and so we let it go. And so I said ghost, but after I told my friend what we had seen, she immediately said it sounds like we could be dealing with a demon. What are your thoughts? So long story short, for those of you who don't know, I used to work night shifts as a security guard at the local port, and it was haunted. Every night we had to go and do our patrol rounds around the whole perimeter and check every single office. The rounds usually lasted about an hour to an hour and 30 minutes, and the place was huge, two mile radius, and even with two of us on the rounds it would still take us a while. So my co-worker Mike, the guy that was with me on my other experiences, had called in sick that night. So I went on my patrol rounds alone. As for the lieutenant, he stayed at the front gate post watching his anime and cameras or whatever. And around 2am I had finished the outdoor round in the truck. Sometimes we also used a four-wheeler or a bike even. So after finishing the outside round, I would have to go inside of every single building and check the offices to make sure no office employee stayed overnight and, you know, in case there's an intruder or trespasser on the property. The buildings were really dark inside as well. The maintenance man would always shut off the breakers in the box right before he'd leave. Unfortunately, security did not have access to those keys. Therefore, I had to use my flashlights to light up the hallways in the offices. The offices alone were pretty creepy, and I would say haunted because of their old age. And the fact that I had to walk around those buildings alone in the dark really creeped me out. It's honestly so dead quiet in there that you could hear my stilt-toe boots echoing through the hallways. Now, the next part is a blur because I began to get chills and hyperventilate. Because as I'm walking through the dark office hallways, I began to hear a scratching-like sound on the walls right next to me. I stopped to listen, but the nail stopped as well. I thought it was probably just me, so I continued walking and I stopped dead ahead in my tracks because the scratching sounds began to get louder this time. I knew right away that this was not normal because things like this have happened before in these places and it's always really freaky. And I had just came out of those offices too, so I could confirm that there was no one in there. I'm right in the middle of the building with the nearest exit being quite a distance away on the other side of the building. But then, I hear pounding on the wall and upon hearing this, I just begin to sprint out of the place with my adrenaline pumping. But the pounding followed me all the way to the end of the hallway and once I got past it, it just stopped. I ran out of the building and this put me on edge for the rest of the night. Like I said, when I entered another hallway, it stopped. But it sounded huge and I tried calling it in to report it but the phone signal in the offices was just complete trash. I actually didn't even bother to finish the round too because I was going to pass out from anxiety I think. So I went back to the front gate and I wrote a report on it. I had never written a report on my other experiences but I was getting fed up with it now so for the first time in my life I actually wrote a report on the paranormal. No, I don't believe it was something logical because those punches were just unbelievably loud and I know for a fact that there was nobody there. Plus, they were so loud that whatever was banging on the wall was definitely not human. I mean, I couldn't even stomp that loud if I tried and I'm a pretty big dude. 
I weigh 227 pounds and I train in powerlifting and there is just no way that that came from something human. When I was a child, I had an interesting life. I don't know if it's because I only remember it, but the paranormal side of things seems to be the most constant and prevalent thing out of my childhood. I hypothesize it's due to the depressing and hostile household that I grew up in. Everyone was dying or struggling and fighting becoming a perfect blend for the paranormal to hit us I suppose but even with that our family felt prone to the experience of these things. Something that I learned after my experiences though is that rumors within the family speculated something my grandpa's father brought about with him after the war as he used to speak to himself and go down to the basement and fight with something only to return with scratches down his back. But I can't exactly prove if this is true or not so take that with a grain of salt. I believe that it has something to do with our Trinadian ancestry. Not that I know much about it but I do know that Obeah was practiced amongst the slaves. But I'm getting off topic. I figured I'd provide backstory to my family though. From my dad experiencing demons to my grandpa experiencing hellhounds and more. The only thing we all have in common is the hostile environments in which we brood these vile things. Anyway, my experiences started sometime when I was around six I'd say. When my father first moved in with my new stepmom. I remember her security alarm randomly going off or doors and such swinging open. I never saw a figure or thing within the house, but others apparently did. My father claimed he laid with who he thought was my stepmom, only to be something else. These events then picked up when we moved to another house. Very bad things happened to me there. It all started with me falling out of my bed in my sleep. This, of course, is what my parents told me when, in reality, I was being pulled out of my bed with marks on my ankles. But writing this honestly gives me some major goosebumps. But then I started sleepwalking too, speaking in my sleep, etc. This all continued and then I began seeing things. Eyes peering around the corner. Simple things like that at first. Just to make matters worse though, the attic was actually in my room. Smack dab in the middle was the decrepit entrance. And my parents told stories of this which they didn't inform me about till many years later. One story of which was dreaming about being locked in there with something, only for it to come into fruition the next day. She climbed up and she got locked in somehow and the light turned off. Really spooky stuff and I understand why they didn't tell me it. The same stuff kept happening even when I went into my mother's house. I'd walk in my sleep and have horrible dreams which would make me have almost seizure-like effects as I dreamt and woke up. I remember one dream where I had a mist go around me and tongues were being spoken as I shaked in real life, even after I woke up. I admit that the dreams may be unrelated, but my gut tells me otherwise. Though some things happened, like doors opening and such, and it was mild compared to the other house, that's for sure. I remember one event though, where I woke up screaming bloody murder and I got out of bed and walked and felt like I was floating. As I walked out of my room, I had my first head-on encounter with this thing, this horrid creature. It kind of looked like a woman, I would say. Stringy hair and missing her bottom jaw with guts hanging out where the lower half should be and she let out the most horrific scream and I just fainted. My parents allegedly ran out and grabbed me, claiming that I just stopped breathing and I was violently shaking. Then I remember waking up again and then they told me to get to the couch and try and sleep but obviously there was no way that I was going to sleep that night. So I ended up just laying on my stomach and cried for a good hour, petrified of what I saw. After that, I did have some other minor experiences, but nothing really to write home about. But when we moved, it continued. It seemed like everywhere we moved, we brought this thing out of the woodwork and with us. When we first moved in and we were watching a movie in the basement, which was a dingy but not that creepy place, we were sitting in an attached room which we made into a man cave. We heard voices and footsteps, the loud ones too, but clear as day like someone broke in. So my father actually pulled out his pistol, so did my stepmom and they checked the house, but there was nothing. No signs of entry and nobody there. 
Out of sheer panic though, I grabbed my machete just in case and they checked the property, looking back in the woods and everything, but there was nothing. We went back to sit down and continued watching the movie, The Lincoln Lawyer. I don't know, felt like I should add that. The one with Matthew McConaughey. And ten or so minutes later, we heard it again, though much more faint this time. It was at that moment, too, that my father told me that we'd all be sleeping in the same room, and of course I happily obliged, not wanting to go back upstairs. A few months later, I was laying in my bed. My parents never let me shut the door either, so in front of me was a long hallway, two door frames and a staircase to their room. And as I dozed off, I shot up with a gut-wrenching feeling just engulfing my entire body as a figure with glowing eyes and a slim body stared at me from the furthest door frame. I, of course, absolutely peaked and tried to go back to the bed thinking it was a nightmare, but I woke up again and I'm not sure what time it was, but it was standing and staring at me from the halfway point now. I, of course, unable to do anything, just went back to bed and grasped the blankets over my head, scared. The next time though, I woke up and looked at my clock first for some odd reason and I guess hoping it was almost time for me to get up almost as if some artificial number would stop this thing, but the time was 3.30, which I later learned was the halfway point of the bewitching hour. And that thing was standing there in my doorframe. As I panicked and screamed, it let out what I think was a smile as I hurriedly covered my face in fear. I was about to die, I thought, gripping the blanket with all my might, hoping maybe it would just go away, and before I knew it... I saw a light gleaming through the holes of the blanket. Daytime had finally arrived, though the feeling of dread stuck with me for the rest of the day. That house, for a lack of a better term, was just really messed up. However, that's not the only memories that I have of there because as I got older I realized that I must have suppressed things which only came out as I got older. I remember that memory only emerged as I was watching The Conjuring, which almost sent me into a full-blown panic attack. And if anything else happened, I don't really know, and my parents kept most of that stuff hidden from me. Though, as time goes by, I think I'm starting to gain more memories. As time went on, though, this stuff just went away with a mix of things like moving to a happier place and becoming a happier and less toxic household to me getting older, I guess. However, a few basic incidences happen, like feeling the energy of certain areas and seeing some basic stuff like a face and such, but nothing too bad though. Only a year ago, I was at my aunt's house, which has been home to many strange things, when the door slammed violently, shooting me up as pictures fell off the wall in the middle of the night, ironically, at 3am. I also had another experience where I was laying in bed when I felt like something sat on my bed violently shooting me awake and watching my bathroom door slam open. As I went to walk out of my room, lightning actually struck, it might be unrelated I don't know, but scared the crap out of me. Also another time was when I lived in a little corner of the house and I woke up at night, 3am again, to have my curtains broken on top of me and this tall figure standing and just staring at me outside just stood there and I did what I always do and tried to fall back to sleep. What's interesting about this tall and lean figure though is that it always seems to follow me but only appear when I have really good days. Like it doesn't want me to enjoy my life or something but I'm not entirely sure. All in all though all of this stuff is just completely perplexing to me. A part of the reason why I'm sharing this is maybe to try and get some answers or theories or even other people's experiences. I'm also sharing this to maybe help someone feel not so alone as they go through some of the similar experiences I did. Anyways, please feel free to ask any questions below and I'll do my best to answer them. Thanks for listening. I begrudgingly earn a living repossessing bank collateral in the form of motor vehicles. As you can probably imagine, most people I deal with are not happy to see me. For some background, I'm not your typical repo man by looking at me. Most guys that I work with are over 6'3", 200 to 300 pounds, bald with a beard. I know that sounds specific, but it really does hold true in my experience. I, on the other hand, am 5'11", 150 pounds, but I do have a beard. 
So I was working out during the day and checking a retail location for a vehicle that I'd been searching for. The address that I was checking was located in a large mall area. I glanced in my rearview mirror to see a red Ford Focus behind me. He made a few of the same turns I did, but I didn't think twice about it. After the seventh or eighth turn that he mimicked though, I decided to pull into a parking lot. I figured that he would either move on or come and talk to me, if that was his goal. I noticed that he was on the phone in my rear view. I parked the truck and watched the car as it parked about 50 feet from me. I noticed the man driving the Focus was staring and pointing at me though as he spoke on the phone, so I decided to ask what his deal was. When I approached, he got out of his vehicle, which was alarming, so I backed off and didn't get closer. I leaned my head out of my open window and I said, Hey sir, is there a reason you're following me? He moves his phone from his ear, covering the microphone, and yells, Yeah, you're harassing people on private property. The cops are on their way. I told him that that was fine and I would wait around to speak to the police. He yelled some more unintelligible nonsense as I put my window up and sat pretty waiting for the police. A few minutes later, a cruiser shows up behind me. The officer approached my window and we spoke about the situation. I told him that I'm permitted on private property unless I'm explicitly asked to leave by someone who owns the property or works security, which he agreed with. Long story short, the police told me that I was good to go and asked that I not engage with this man as I left. I complied and planned to move on with my day. About 20 minutes after all of this, I glanced in my rear view to see the same focus driving a couple of cars behind me. So, I parked again, out of frustration now. I immediately exited my truck and lit a cigarette. The man driving his car screeched up beside me and exited his car without putting it in park, rather just putting it in neutral. As his car begins to roll away, he is turned away from it, screaming at me about violating his right to privacy and harassing the public at this mall. I calmly told him that I was already cleared by the PD and that I was losing patience. I told him that he needed to leave right then before I called the police. And it was at this point that his vehicle struck the concrete base of a light pole and stopped. He started screaming and saying that I crashed his car. I told him that I had dashcam footage that would negate that claim and that's when he charged me. Now remember, I'm not a big guy but I've dealt with plenty of confrontation at this job and this guy did not appear coordinated at all. I stepped out of his path and guided him to the ground, telling him to stay down while I leave and to leave me alone. I got in my truck and I left. Looking back, I absolutely should have called the police again as I've gotten the officer's cell phone number and badge number and everything. But this story all comes to a head two nights later in a bizarre turn of events that genuinely scared me. At this point, I had just gotten married to my lovely wife and we were living in our little one bedroom in our hip little suburb of a major Midwest city. It was a Friday night and I decided I would go and grab some beers for the wife and I to enjoy after a long week. As I was leaving the store without booze, I saw a maroon Ford Focus in the parking lot, seemingly unoccupied. I made a mental note of the coincidence given the bizarre ordeal that I had a couple of days prior, but didn't think too much more of it. As I pulled into my apartment's parking lot, the Focus pulled in behind me. I hadn't noticed it followed me until this point, and I lived on the third floor, so I decided I was going to hustle up the steps, just in case this was the same guy, and he'd stalked me or something in order to extract his revenge for whatever perceived transgression that I'd bothered him with. But my plan didn't work. He followed me to my patio, where my wife was waiting, again, unbeknownst to me. I was apparently not feeling very observant that night, and that was when this guy snuck up, crouching behind our small fence. Neither of us knew that he was there until he said, still hidden from view, pretty girl. I snapped to my feet and began to look around when I spotted him. I knew instantly it was him too, and I immediately ordered my wife to go inside, lock the door and call the police. When I approached him, he drew a small switchblade and pointed it at my belly. I began to back up with my hands up saying something along the lines of, we don't have to do this, what do you want? And he told me that he wanted me to call my wife back outside, but that was not going to happen. 
I'd rather be stabbed than expose her to this man, so I told him as much. He lunged at me with the knife, grazing and cutting my side as I attempted to grab and redirect his forearm. Then he went to the ground where he lost his knife. I got some knees to connect to his head and when the police lights became visible I heard shouting. Long story short, Buddy was arrested on sight and I provided the badge number and the PD of the officer from work a couple of days prior in order to corroborate my claims. I decided to press charges and as far as I know he's awaiting a court date. I'm sure that I'll have to be involved in it, which I'm not looking forward to. So I'm female, 23 now, and in this story I was 21 with a 4 month old baby. He's mine and he's 2 now. I'm about 5 foot 9, a, a bit overweight, and I have social anxiety around new people. So I went with my sister, 26 and 5 feet tall to her work as she worked at a very nice restaurant in a shopping center and we went straight there for her 6pm start after being in the city all day collecting money for a cat rescue. I'm just chilling out, eating good food and binging on reddit when I decide I want to smoke. I know, bad habits. So I pack up the kidlet and let my sister know that I'm going out to the car park to have a smoke as she passes through the dining area. The car park was about... 70 meters away I think from the restaurant, had good lighting and because it was so late, I could hang around near the doors. And this is where it starts to get creepy. So the security guard was doing his rounds, about my height and Indian. I'm not trying to be racist here and I know that this is just anecdotal but most of my experiences with Indians personally have not been all that good. But anyway, he decides to check on me and I was like, that's cool man, I'm just having a smoke. And the conversation went something like this. Hey, uh, how you doing? You okay? Hi, yeah, I'm pretty good. Uh, just waiting for my sister to get off work. Ah, good, good. Uh, your baby? A very cute baby. I have four at home. You got a husband? Yeah, he's my baby. Uh, that's good. Uh, I have a fiancé complete lie mind you I was 100% single but he was already making me a little bit anxious you know I could be husband I look after baby for you I look after you uh <laughs> no thanks uh, I'm sure your wife wouldn't appreciate that anyway uh, no no wife love baby wife will love you you can come home with me I finished my smoke and I'd been moving the pram further away from him every second uh <laughs> Uh, no thanks, sir. Uh, I gotta go, okay? He then follows me inside. I go all around the mostly closed shopping center, hoping to lose him in Coles. I lost him for about five seconds, but Coles had shut for the night. The only place left open was my sister's work, so I went back there, even though I didn't want him to know where I was. As I was about to walk into the restaurant, I saw him coming up the escalator, and he was still watching me. I take the last two steps towards the hostess who happened to be the owner's daughter and told her what was going on. At this point, the security guard is standing in front of the restaurant, still staring at me. The hostess takes me to a semi-secluded booth and goes to talk to her dad about the situation. As she's gone, the creepy security guard came into the dining area, searched for me and then came and sat at my booth, way too close to me and my child. So, how old are you? I want to ravish you, pretty woman. You be my mother to my babies. We make cute babies. And at this point, it was very clear that I was very uncomfortable. He still made it worse, though. But don't worry. I security. I protect you and baby. He's searching across the table with one hand now. The other hand is reaching towards my pram. I'm frozen. I don't care about the hand near me. I'm watching the other one because nobody touches my baby. I'm about to snap, go full mama bear mode when the owner, 40s or 50s, 6 foot plus big wide build at the restaurant, steps in asking if there's a problem. Hey, is there a problem here? Uh, no, no problem, just talking to my lovely lady. This is a customer, has she done something wrong? No, never, she's my lady, see? We're going to get married. He grins creepily, the silent warning to play along is etched into his face. 
No, I'm not. Please, just leave me alone. I just want to eat my dinner. <laughs> Funny lady, right? See, we joke. I don't know you. Please, just leave me alone. She says she wants you to leave now, right, bud? Ah, she's just messing. She loved me. I'll be waiting for you, pretty lady. He leaves at this point, and the other guy makes sure I'm okay and moves me to the employee break room and fills my sister in too. But two hours later, and my sister has finished her shift, we packed up and we head to the car. And the guy appears out of nowhere. I think that he was actually waiting for me the entire time. I take pretty lady and baby home now, okay? Come on, pretty lady. We go home. And like an angel steps out from his car, the guy from the restaurant stands right behind this dude. Hey, bud. She's going home with her sister, all right? No. A pretty lady mine. She come home with me. Hey, lady. Get in your car. I'll take care of this. So we get into the car and we go home. I found out the next day from my sister that her boss had physically restrained this guy because he went to grab my arm as I was getting into the car and then got him fired and permanently banned from that shopping center. The whole situation was really messed up and quite honestly quite creepy. I was 15 years old and back in those days, you'd usually catch my friends and I at the big AMC movie theater. It's a huge theater, it kind of reminds me of an airport almost and it was a popular hangout for kids that age on weekends. I remember going to the movies one night with friends and a group of guys approached us. We started chatting and flirting I must admit as you do at that age and they said that they went to one of the local high schools. One of the guys that I was talking to eventually asked for my phone number and I gave it to him. I was naive and thought that this was pretty harmless and these were the days before cell phones were ubiquitous so I gave him my home phone number. And to my surprise, he called me maybe a day or two after that and we talked for a bit. We had a few more phone conversations here and there before he asked me on a date. As we made plans to meet, he told me that he needed to tell me something. He admitted that he wasn't actually 16 or whatever age he said he was and he wasn't even in high school. He was 22 in fact. I fell silent trying to think of my response but there was more. Not only was he 22 but he had been in prison and was recently released. Why? For accessory to murder for being in the car when his friend shot someone while they were driving by. I still remember the feeling of just being frozen in fear and I calmly said that I didn't want to talk to him anymore and to please never call me again and I hung up. After I hung up though, the phone immediately started ringing. I picked it up but before I could even say hello, this man had called back and was already screaming at the top of his lungs into the phone. I can't remember exactly what he was saying, but it was along the lines of, don't you ever hang up on me again, calling me every name in the book. So what did I do? I hung up again, this time leaving the phone off of the receiver. I remember being so scared to tell my parents because I didn't want them to be disappointed in me. They were always so proud of me for making good decisions. It was my fault after all, giving some guy I'd just met my phone number, so... I didn't say anything at first. The calls kept coming, but to keep my parents in the dark, I usually made sure that I was the one answering the phone when it rang. And he told me that he had put my home phone number into a reverse phone directory and found my address. He would call and say things like, I like your sister's new green car to make sure I knew that he was watching the house. Around this time, I developed a fear of being home alone. I couldn't be alone even for a minute, so if my parents and sister were ever gone, I'd call a neighbor friend to spend time with me. One night, my parents were in bed, but my sister and I were up late watching TV. When we saw a car pull into our driveway and sit there with the lights on. I couldn't see who was in it, but I knew that it was him. And shortly after that, everything just stopped. I remember thinking how crazy it was that he had done all that and then just disappeared. A year, maybe two years later, I was sitting at home watching the finale of American Idol. 
It's funny the little random details you remember when something significant happens. And the phone rang. But the caller ID said it was coming from a correctional facility. Confused, I answered it and it was a collect call from you can guess who. I honestly couldn't believe it and I obviously didn't accept the call and I just hung up. And I never heard from him again. I did eventually tell my parents about this years later and they said, no wonder you were so scared to be alone. I should have told them at the time, I know, because it could have escalated much further than what it did. This story actually mirrors a similar experience I had a year ago too, one that I've shared elsewhere. I really do wonder if there's something about me that attracts these types of people too after two occurrences like this. One lapse in judgment can lead to situations like these. Also, before I forget to mention this, one of his harassing phone calls was particularly creepy because he called me and he described how he saw a dog get hit by a car on the highway and the whole time he was just kind of laughing to himself. Not in a way that was just intended to scare me, but he was laughing like he genuinely found it funny. Which leads me to believe that this person was an absolute psychopath. Let's go all the way back to when a friend and I were around 14 years old. This was in the days before the mass adoption of the internet and so a lot of time was just spent outdoors after school playing around with friends. Where I'm from, it would get fairly dark early in the winter and the house I grew up in had a fairly large plot of land surrounding it, which is where this story takes place. So, a game that my friend and I really enjoyed around this time was to play hide and seek using a torch, a flashlight for US readers, to help find the person who was hiding. My parents had this fairly powerful one that we would sneak out of the house with and then use in the game. The person seeking would close their eyes and count to 50 or so, and the person hiding would run off into the night and try to get a spot where they wouldn't be easily found. The big rule of the game though was that the person seeking had to keep the torch on at all times and the person hiding was discovered if illuminated by said torch. It made for a fun game of cat and mouse and where you could know where your seeker was and use this to your advantage when repositioning. But of course, they could easily spin around quickly and cast a large circle of light over the trees or whatever and catch sight of your white shirt or sneakers. It kept us entertained anyway, and I guess my parents thought that it was nice that we were doing stuff outside, although it often ended up being fairly creepy and late. But this one time, it was my turn to be the person hiding, and I headed down to what I felt might be a good spot, uh, way off towards the far boundary wall of the house. The property was encircled by land, but beyond the low stone wall surrounding it were other houses with their own bits of land. It was very dark away from any other house lights and in this area there was an old abandoned hut that was falling apart, long grass, a few trees and a large trench that was deep enough to stand in and disappear below ground level. But the obvious place to hide was either under or inside the hut. The door was locked but it had no windows. Though for whatever reason I felt that this was too easy this time around and I took the chance to get down into the grass just close enough to the ditch that I could slide into it if needed but keep my head up to watch for the approach of the lamp. But nothing happened for a long time too but I just had a feeling that someone was close by. I glanced off to the side and caught sight of my friend. Only he wasn't using the torch that sneak. He appeared to have his hand over the end of it so that the light wasn't coming out or he had maybe turned it off or something and was keeping his hand near the button in order to snap it on again if he needed to. But clearly though, he'd got annoyed that the light was giving him away and I was avoiding him when really he'd just been looking in the wrong place. The land available to us wasn't that vast, but basically if you were smart, you could use the threat of the moving spot lamp to force the person to move and just listen out for the sounds of that, but gradually pinpointing where they must be. But no, my friend wasn't doing this. He was trying to do things the easy way and get one up on me and probably try to give me a jump to boot. Well, I wasn't going to let him do that. So I slid into the ditch. And now, I was going to be very hard to find without shining that light down into where I was. Particularly with the hut acting as a great distraction. I decided not to even try to get away since I couldn't watch for the light to see which way he was looking, so I just stayed there very still. 
annoyingly, despite my very clear hiding spot. My friend got closer and closer, and even closer to the trench, brushing through the grass in a very deliberate manner and seeming to have a good idea of where I was. I waited for the jig to be up, trying not to move. I still didn't see any flashlight, and then after what felt like forever, my friend walked right by and just kept going. I still didn't move because I really, really wanted him to never find me because he was cheating. And it was only when I saw the light way off back towards the house that I climbed out of the ditch and started to look back the other way. I eventually got caught and in the debrief after the round, I told my friend just how close he had gotten to finding me in the ditch. And he looked slightly concerned. Ah, uh, dude, I didn't go up that way, he said. I laughed as I thought that he was messing with me. Yes, you did, I replied. You were covering the torch trying to catch me out. And I'll never forget his face as it lost some of its color. Ah, uh, dude, that wasn't me. I don't think we ever ran back inside of a house as fast as we did in that moment. I still have no idea who it was down that part of the property in the dark that night or what they were holding in their hands and why they seemed to be searching for someone, probably me, despite very much so not being invited to play our game. All I do know is that after this, we never really played hide and seek down there again. These events transpired between last September and December. In September, I moved into student hall which is university accommodation, which is eight people with a room each and shared living space and a kitchen. Everyone was great and we had great freshers week and we didn't even notice that we actually had a nightmare living amongst us. Adam. Adam was the oldest of our flat. He was 23 and we were all between the ages of 18 and 19. There were us three girls and five guys. Adam is a great looking guy, he wore expensive trendy designer clothes and was always very well groomed and he was the life and soul of our flat parties and was always the first one to the bar whenever we hit the clubs and stuff. So two of our flats were very flirty with each other, Adam and one of my flatmates called Jennifer and they always had this flirty banter and always chose each other whenever we played truth or dare or one of those types of student drinking games. They were obviously into each other, but Jennifer said one night that she got this weird vibe from Adam when he was drunk, which another one of my flatmates, Callum, also picked up on. In early October one night, we got together as we normally do on a Friday night to do a few drinking games and then hit the students' nightclub as most students do on a Friday. Adam does the normal thing and gets everyone their drinks and then as the night goes on a few of us notice that Adam is buying shots for just himself and Jennifer which isn't normally what he does but whatever I guess. It gets to 2am and although we have all split up a couple of times and we do when we go to smoke outside and stuff but we notice that Adam and Jennifer aren't anywhere to be found and we can't get in touch with them. But another one of my flatmates tells me to chill and they've probably just hit it off with each other because they've been flirty for a couple of weeks now. The next morning I'm taking some laundry to the laundry room and Jennifer comes out of Adam's room looking like she has the worst hangover that I've ever seen. She claims that she remembers nothing of last night and is slightly concerned that she woke up in Adam's room. Jennifer has everything until she tries to get into her room and finds that she had actually lost her car key to her room. They search Adam's room high and low and can't find it anywhere, so we put it down to her losing it and she has to buy a replacement card. And this is where things get creepy. Now, there's a lot to this story, but I'll just include the major things for time's sake. So Jennifer has one hell of a busy schedule in university and is out mostly all week. And over the weeks, she finds that some of her items of her clothing are going missing. Mainly underwear and gym clothing like sports bras and stuff. But she's messy and her room is very much a tip so she kind of puts it down to just being messy. Jen is also a heavy sleeper but one night she does half wake up and notices that... Her door is slightly ajar, which is weird as it takes a keycard to get into someone's room, when the door is locked that is. 
she does have sleep paralysis, so she kind of puts it down to night terrors or something, which she has occasionally. But there's this one night that she awakens to a figure at the end of her bed. But like the other time, she puts this down to her sleep paralysis again and thinks nothing more of it at the time. Jennifer continues to get really strange vibes from Adam when we're drinking and making creepy passing comments about Jennifer's physical appearance. But Jennifer is creeped out when she reveals that she's going on a coffee date with a guy from her course. Adam doesn't say anything about this, but when she's on her date, Adam is coincidentally in the same coffee shop as her and her date. And she gets the feeling that he was watching her for the entire date, which made her really uncomfortable. But when Jennifer asked why Adam was in the coffee shop, he just replied with, Because I felt like it. At the time, I didn't see why Jennifer saw this as such a big issue, but later on in the story, I see why she was so concerned by this. But Jennifer's night terrors continued, but personal belongings were going missing now too, and one of these included a locket containing a picture of her and her deceased grandmother, which upset Jennifer quite a bit, and she was now very suspicious. So basically, she has suspicions that someone has access to her room, and she does suspect that it's someone in her flat. And yes, the only one that she actually suspects is Adam. Jennifer then tells me that she actually wants to put a camera in her hallway to see if anyone is accessing her room, especially at night, and comes up with a ridiculous but a pretty genius idea. But one of our flatmates is a cyclist and he has one of those helmets with a GoPro on it. So one night he leaves his bicycle and helmet in the long hallway of our flat with the GoPro facing down the hallway on record. Jennifer and Adam are in the opposite rooms at the far end of the hallway so the GoPro is in great position at the end. For the first two nights of doing this, there's really nothing to report, because the battery just ran out. But on the third night, her suspicions are confirmed. Adam actually has her keycard, which Hall's office told her got deactivated when she got a new one, but that clearly wasn't the case, as he'd been getting into her room and watching her while she slept. Again though, she's a very heavy sleeper, so she barely wakes up. We're now in December though and getting close to Christmas break and Jennifer makes a report about Adam but Adam has very rarely been seen lately and after about a week of security knocking on his door, they finally open up his room to find that it had been emptied as if someone had left in a rush. But some of the things that were found are really disturbing. Jennifer's missing clothing items are found at the bottom of the empty wardrobe the candid pictures of Jennifer are there, myself and the other girl in our flat, Rachel. Empty whiskey bottles are littered around the room, as well as small drug-like bags are found in his drawers, some still containing drugs as well. And a flash drive is also found. And we were never informed just what exactly was on it. But we were told that Adam would be getting kicked out for this, and the police were going to contact him. And since then, we have never seen Adam or ever heard what actually happened to him. But it certainly has been a harrowing experience for all of our flat. But mainly Jennifer, though, who is now very careful with who she trusts. We still don't know exactly who Adam was and what he was up to, but we have some pretty good theories. And I'm guessing that you probably get what they are. I worked as a cocktail waitress when I was 22. My shift was from 5pm until 2am. As a waitress, I'd become used to being harassed. Usually it wasn't anything too over the top or frightening. Most customers were just regulars who flirted kind of innocently anyway. Just good natured banter, nothing threatening or in any way sinister. And up until this night, I'd never felt a sense of danger from any of the customers that I'd waited on. On this particular night though, everything changed. I was being harassed by a creepy customer that I'd never seen before. He said such inappropriate things to me that it honestly crept me out. He was relentless too with his inappropriate remarks. And at one point, as I was serving him his drink, he reached out and put his hand on my ass. After this happened, I never went back to his table again. If he wanted another drink, then he'd have to go up to the bar and ask the bartender himself. I was through with waiting on this sinister creep. 
This happened back in 1978, so it was a time when I didn't have any recourse when things like this happened. The bartender only made customers leave when they were far too drunk to sit on a bar stool or at a table or booth. Otherwise, we were on our own to deal with creepy customers. At closing, though, he finally left, and even though he was gone, I still felt such a sense of just unease that I kind of just wanted to go home. I wasn't easily spooked, but this guy had really freaked me out. There was just something really off about him. It took me nearly an hour after closing to complete the work and the cleaning that I had to do to have the bar ready for the following day. So, it was about 3am as I made my way through the dark parking lot to get to my car. It was such a deserted and isolated place at night. The parking lot had woods that surrounded it and that in and of itself was pretty creepy. But as I was about halfway to my car, out of the corner of my eye, I saw him. My heart began to pound as I realized that he had waited in the lot for me to come out. And I knew then that I had to get to the safety of my car or this man was going to do God knows what to me. Luckily, I was young and fit whereas this man was in his late 40s and very much overweight. My thoughts were quickly assessing my situation. I didn't want to be kidnapped and murdered. That was the scenario I envisioned if this man got to me before I could get to my car. I knew that I would have to make a run for it, so I just ran as fast as possible. I jumped inside the car and locked the door, and it wasn't one moment too soon because this man was now at my driver's side window demanding for me to roll it down. He kept yelling that he didn't want to hurt me, he only wanted to talk. He began to pound on the window as I fumbled with my keys to try and get the hell out of there. I began to fear that he'd actually shatter my window and get his hands on me. Finally though, I got my car started and as I put the car into reverse and backed out, he began to scream bloody murder. He was yelling for me to stop because I'd run over his foot. But my gut instinct told me that this man was faking the injury to get me out of my car. And I was not going to get out of that car for any reason. And I just drove home as fast as I could. Once home, I called the police and they came to take my report and get my description of the guy. At this point, I wasn't certain about whether I had injured him or not. I explained all of this to the police officer and the police sent another officer to the parking lot to see if he was still there and suffering from an injury, but he wasn't. Nobody called the police to report a hit and run either and the police told me that I'd done the right thing by not falling for his ruse. I called my boss the following day and told him that I wouldn't be returning to work. I'd never been so frightened by anyone before. It was a night in which I truly feared for my life, and there was just no way that I could make myself return to that job. And that night still haunts my dreams. So my friend David has lived in this house for about five years now. My other friend, Brent, used to live there too with him with a few others. David lives in this house alone now, but we're all friends and visit a few times a week. And Brent used to tell me all the time about just how haunted the place was, but out of the four years I've known him, I've never really seen anything, so I just kind of wrote it all off. One night, about a year ago I'd say, Brent and I were house-sitting for David while he was out of town, feeding the cats, watering the plants, and just hanging out because we had nothing better to really do anyway. I went downstairs to pee because Brent was in the bathroom upstairs, and as I walked back up, I felt something touch my shoulder and I fell down. It wasn't a grab, but it was kind of like a, a shove almost. I convinced Brent to go downstairs with me and see what the hell that was or if it was just a coincidence. We left the lights off because I thought it would be more fun and could potentially see something and just kind of sat there in the dark on opposite ends of the room. The basement had no windows and it was just one big open room with a bathroom and a single bedroom that went off of it. Brent sat by the staircase and I sat all the way opposite. We hadn't sat there for more than five minutes I'd say in silence when... I saw an orange light manifest on my side of the room and fly just all the way into the bedroom and turn the corner. It was about seven feet in the air and I, obviously terrified, launched myself off the ground and on my hands and feet barreled toward Brent. I said, did you see that? And all he said in an extremely calm voice was, 
The orange light? Yeah. Upon seeing this, we made our own makeshift Ouija board and sat in that room. And, in no time at all, we were getting responses. I've known Brent for four years and it's easy to say that he's my best friend. He had no reason to mess with me and is extremely trustworthy. He's a ride or die kind of guy. But, we got an alleged spirit coming through named Ham. We asked if they were initials and just got a no. But then, the cat launched out of the room and I asked, can the cat see you and again got no. All of the responses were misspelled but easy enough to figure out what they were supposed to be. And the following is what happened. So, I asked some questions and they went like this. How many of you are there? We got the answer of 15. Do you know my name? And my name came through. Do you know my dog's name? And yes, my dog's name came through. Do you follow me home? And then it said no. And then I asked, Ham, what do you want from us? And it said, Run, demon. And you bet that I flew out of that basement as fast as I possibly could. One last spooky thing happened on the way out though. I had my radio on as I was backing out of the driveway and the signal cut out multiple times until I hit the street. Now, I know that that could have been a coincidence, but it has never happened in my car before. Also, I've never seen Brent that visibly shaken, especially from the house that he lived in for years, because he stayed at my house that night. On exactly May 26th of 2017, me and my brother Brandon and his friend Herbie went on a spur of the moment camping trip. The spot that we had in mind was a place not far from where we lived, behind a church called Holtz Baptist Church. When I got off work, I met Brandon and Herbie at our grandparents' house to get our gear ready and we made it a sort of bare bones trip due to the short amount of time that we had to get everything ready. Of course, being the outdoors lover that she was, my dog Angel was going to tag along with us. If you haven't heard my other story, she's a Jack Russell Rat Terrier mix. So we loaded up our stuff and ourselves into my grandfather's little blue Ford Festiva and we were off towards our spot. It's about a 10 minute drive from our grandparents' house, so in a short time we'd arrive there. The place where you park is beside the church and it's gated off so that nobody can take their trucks or four-wheelers down the gravel road. So we unloaded the Festiva, climbed over the gate and started making our way towards the campsite. About a hundred feet into the gravel road, the lake had risen up into it so we couldn't actually walk across and keep going. Instead, we found a small deer trail that led up the bank and around the water. There was a lower trail that ran parallel to the bank and the higher trail went up a little higher. For whatever reason, we took the higher trail and for a short while we snaked through the woods and finally we reached the end of the deer trail. It abruptly ended at the side of the bank and we had to slide down it about 10 feet I'd say to get back onto the gravel road. But once we were all back down, it was about a third of a mile back to where we would be setting up camp. It was hot that day and there were ticks and mosquitoes just everywhere biting us constantly. When we made it to camp though, we sat our stuff down and started looking for ticks that might have hitched a ride onto our pant legs. Sure enough, we found a lot of ticks on us all. This irritated Brandon extremely as he had found one in his hair. Herbie and I just laughed as we cursed and fumbled around trying to get the tick off of him. And shortly after that, we set up camp. It was a simple campsite, just nestled down in a small flat spot down near the lake. It's actually a really nice spot. I started setting up tent and I sent the other two with the axe to look for some dry wood. I tied Angel to a small tree next to the tent and as soon as I got it set up, she just kind of plopped down in front of it as if she had put it up or something. About that time, the boys had drug back some sticks and things like that back to the site. Some of them were dry but most of them were a little damp. I'm pretty good at making fires, so with a little persuasion, the fire finally got started around dusk or so. My brother jokingly yelled out, When are you going to cook some food, honey? I'm starving. I agreed and went back to my backpack to get out the cast iron skillet. 
only to realize that I had left the stupid thing sitting at the house instead of putting it in my bag. Slightly irritated, I went to go get the hot dogs out of the cooler. I guess we'll be cooking our wieners on a stick tonight, boys, I said as I turned around holding the pack of hot dogs. Then I noticed Brandon's peace tea can laying on the ground in front of him. I asked him to hand me the can and I promptly cut off the top of it, washed it out, filled it halfway with some of our drinking water, put some hot dogs in it and sat it down in the coals of the fire. Turns out we didn't even need the stupid cast iron skillet. In about 10 minutes the dogs were all cooked and we were ready to eat. I handed them out and we all chowed down on them and of course I couldn't leave Angel out so I ripped one of the hot dogs up and I gave it to her. We all finished and put the food stuff away and I grabbed a Red Bull out of the cooler, cracked it open and asked Herbie if he had ever seen a ghost before. <laughs> well, I can't see what doesn't exist, he said, laughing back. You don't believe in ghosts? I asked. Nah, oh, man, that shit ain't real. It's just for movies. But Brennan and I had shared some of our stories with Herbie before, but he didn't believe us. We all were just on shrooms or something when we saw that shit. There's no way that it was actually real, he said, laughing again. I said, one day something's going to happen to you, man, that scares you shitless, and you're going to have no explanation for it, and when it does, you'll believe me then. He just shrugged it off, and we continued talking about all different things for a few more hours. We were all tired after talking and shooting the breeze, so we all agreed that it was time to hit the sheets. We all climbed into the tent and started getting settled in. From left to right, it was me, an angel, Brandon, and then Herbie. I think Herbie and I fell asleep before Brandon. I'm not sure how long I was asleep too before Brandon woke me up, saying, Man, there's ticks just all over this tent, and they're getting on me. In my halfway asleepness, I just told him to shut up and go back to sleep. He said that he hadn't been to bed yet because of the ticks, and he said that he was hearing things outside of the tent. Something splashing around in the water. I told him that it was probably just a fish and not to worry about it. I fell asleep again, and about an hour later was woken up once more, but this time I was hearing things outside the tent too. Brandon had fell asleep, and behind our tent I could hear what sounded like somebody getting out of the lake and taking steps through the woods. It sounded like when you get out of a pool and all of the water kind of splatters and drips underneath you. This obviously kind of freaked me out a bit, but I was so sleepy that I just fell back asleep right after that. I was woken up again, and this time it was Brandon smacking me to get up. I raised up and asked what was wrong with him. Dude, I found a tick in my ear. I'm tired of this campsite, man. Let's just get out of here. I looked at my phone and it was about 4am at this point. I sighed and agreed to leave just so that he would shut up about it. We shook Herbie awake and got out of the tent and it was pitch black out so I tried to start the fire back up but all the wood was too damp and it just wouldn't catch. With no light, I went searching for my flashlights that I'd brought with us. I turned it on and... nothing. It was completely dead. Great, I thought. I got my iPhone and turned the flashlight on and the warning popped up saying that I only had 20% battery left. Slightly pissed at this point, I told them to help me get all the stuff together so that we can leave before the phone dies and we don't have any light. Like every camping trip ever, the gear you bring is never packed up well when you go to leave as well. Our sleeping bags were sloppily rolled up, the tent bag was stuffed full in a really awkward way which made it hard to carry properly, our chairs kept coming undone and getting caught on everything and it wasn't a very fun walk back. I was walking Angel on a leash with my other hands full of gear. The boys both had their hands full too. Brandon was carrying the axe in a very haphazardous way, which it kind of made me a bit nervous. But my hands were just so awkwardly packed that I had to sit it all down and just kind of readjust it all. But once I sat down, I looked down at Angel and she was dead fixed on something in front of us in the darkness. Her hair standing up on her back and she was growling now. I assumed that it was a raccoon or a possum and just motioned her to look away, but... She wasn't having it. 
She stayed locked onto the dark and just wouldn't budge. I just readjusted my stuff and we pushed on at this point. And as we were walking around the last corner to where the lake had come over the gravel path, I caught sight of something running on two legs around the corner towards the water. The boys didn't see it, but this thoroughly freaked me out and I demanded that Brandon give me the axe in exchange for Angel. We slowly walked forward and then we all saw it. It was a, a small humanoid shaped figure. It was really short and maybe two feet tall and looked as if it just had no neck. I couldn't make out any features on its face or anything because my light wasn't that powerful. It just showed silhouettes. Angel started nearly choking herself trying to chase the creature, growling and barking angrily, and upon hearing Angel, it immediately turned and ran towards the water and dove right in. In disbelief, we just kind of stood there listening to it splash around, and then it just started screeching. It sounded aggressive, and honestly, it scared the crap out of all of us. Boys, go up the bank now, I said to the guys, and we all ran for the bank. Mind you, this bank is about 10 feet high and is nearly straight up and down. We all frantically tried to get up and struggled because of all the gear that we were carrying. Angel was also fighting Brandon, trying to go back and fight the creature and it was preventing him from getting up the bank. And at this point, I hear the creature get out of the water and start running towards where we were at. It was making this strange kind of gurgling noise as it was running. My fear took over and I reached down to Brandon, grabbed his pants by the waist and threw him and Angel both on the top of the bank. I then just yelled, trail, run, go, it's coming, the bank. And I wasn't lying because as we started running, I could hear it scratching at the shale bank behind us, continuing to make the disturbing gurgling noise. We all ran through the woods fighting low-hanging branches, blackberry bushes, spider webs and roots as we hear the creature jump back into the water and screech at us. We ran until we saw what we didn't want to see. The bank again. We had stupidly taken the wrong trail and ended up closer to the water and therefore the creature too. My brother and Herbie were both in tears at this point screaming at me, what the fuck is that thing? What do we do? So I started swinging the axe and hitting anything that I could to try and scare the creature away. I started screaming back at it, but then we started hearing things walking above us too. I picked up Angel and we all just ran for it and through the bush and we just made our own path back down to the gravel road. And once we got back to the gravel, we ran as fast as we could back to the Festiva. In a blind panic, I forced the rear hatch open, threw Angel in, shoved Herbie into the back seat, Brandon jumped into the passenger seat, and then I got in. As soon as the car started, I took off as fast as the little Ford would go, and the ride home was very quiet. I broke the silence, though, with the question, did, did that really just happen? Is everyone all right? And they both replied, yes, it really did. But I could tell by the look on their faces that they were both petrified. We stopped at a waffle house in town for breakfast and we just kind of sat there quietly eating. Everybody was still freaked out. Even our waitress noticed that we were pale and asked what was wrong. But we made up some lie because Lord knows that there's no way that she would believe us, even if we did tell her. It truly scared us all, and to this day, I have no idea what it could have been. I know that it ran on two legs, and the screech was just unforgettable. If you've made it this far too, please let me know your thoughts, because I really want to know what you guys think of all this. I live in a rural area that is slowly being developed. My house was built on a wooded lot that is fairly dense and isn't an old forest. The trees are really tall, about two and a half times taller than a two-story home. And also, my neighborhood, if you can even call it that, is just a few houses built on a pretty long gravel road. But the entirety of the houses are built within this old, dense forest which extends about a mile in every direction. These homes are only about three years old. So I take my dog for a walk on the gravel road several times a day, but the night walks tend to be the most eerie. 
I've come along coyotes that creepily watch us from the woods until I shout at them. Actually, just a couple of weeks ago, I even walked up on a bear. I've learned to bring a bright 1000 lumen flashlight on my walks after this. But now for the creepy part. So sometimes when walking in these woods, they can just be eerily quiet. Anyone who spent a good amount of time in the woods knows that the woods are actually pretty noisy. However, on these nights, it's virtually silent. No wind in the leaves and no clacking of swaying tree branches, no crickets. And it's on these nights that I hate these walks. I just get the sensation that I'm being watched. Sometimes I even get goosebumps because the sensation that we're being watched is just so strong. On occasion, I can hear branches or tree limbs snapping and... Now, in the thick woods, it's totally normal to hear a random limb break off and fall to the ground. But the sound of a limb breaking naturally versus the sound of one being stepped on are very different. Sometimes I can hear branches snapping more frequently than I should as well, as if several people were hiding in the woods snapping branches off of trees or something. Most times, though, I just hear them around me, but I just can't find a cause. However, two nights ago, I heard the branches snapping again. But this was very clearly the sound of intentional branches being snapped this time too. But the sound was coming from high up in the top of the trees. I shined my light up there but couldn't see anything there so I just kept walking. Then more branches snapping. I stopped and looked again but nothing. I started to walk again but then another branch in the treetop snapped again. This time I just kept walking and as I did I could hear the sound of snapping branches in the treetops following me. This continued for about two minutes as I started fast walking to my home, branches being snapped behind me in the trees. Then, tonight, which is what prompted this story, I again had the weird uncomfortable feeling but the walk was pretty much uneventful which was different. As I'm almost home my dog was sniffing around a bush. He ended up getting a small branch stuck on his leash, so I grabbed the branch and threw it back into the woods, hearing it hit a bush. However, the moment I turned to walk, I heard something behind me which startled us. I turned around to see the same branch. It was a fairly distinct shaped branch, almost like a large but skinny wishbone of a turkey, which I just threw into the woods, back at my feet. I looked into the woods, but... There was nothing there, but something had definitely thrown back the branch back at my feet. And at this point, I went straight home after that, completely spooked. I really don't know what's going on, but it seems as if this last week or so that activity has just increased dramatically. I'm really not sure what to think of it all, or if there's some sort of precipitating factor. But either way, I hope you guys found this interesting, and... As of now, I'm stopping my walks. This happened to me back in 2011. I was 20 years old and was living with my grandpa and sister. My grandpa was in the hospital at the time and during the week that he was away, a lot of just weird things would happen at home. So my sister and I would often sleep in the living room. But one night, my sister went out with her friends and left me alone at the house. It was around midnight and I decided to get some sleep since I had an early class the next morning. I'm afraid of the dark and I can't fall asleep without some sort of light, so I left the bathroom and the kitchen light on. In my house, it was just enough to partially illuminate the living room too. So, I'm on the couch just trying to fall asleep and as I'm laying there, I hear the keys in the door. The door opens and in walks my mum, or at least the silhouette of my mum. I was actually surprised to see her because, well, it was late and my mum lives about 30 miles outside the city. I asked her what she's doing there and she told me that she was going to spend the night and go to work from there in the morning. She sounded super irritated and when I think about it, I couldn't see her face, only the outline of her body and her curly hair. Without my glasses or contacts, my vision sucks pretty bad and it was somewhat dark in the living room. Anyways, she tells me that she's going to shower and walks down the hall and closes the bathroom door. I'm thinking, okay, random, but whatever, and I look at my phone and it's one in the morning now, so 
I decided to just try and go to sleep for real and eventually I managed to. I guess some time passes and I end up jolting awake from my sleep with just an overwhelming sense of dread. I notice that the door to the bathroom is still closed and I call out to my mum but I get no answer. I go to the bathroom and open the door but the room is empty. Getting even more creeped out, I search the entire house calling out for her until I realize eventually that I'm all alone. At this point, I start crying because I'm just too freaked out so I call my sister and ask where she is. Thankfully, she had just pulled up and was talking to a friend on the driveway. When she comes inside, I told her what happened and she was obviously really weirded out. I look at my phone and it's a little after 2.30 in the morning so I force myself to calm down and I go back to sleep. The next morning I called my mum and asked if she came over the night before and she sounds confused because she was at her house the entire night. This was the weirdest and creepiest thing that has ever happened to me. I know that I wasn't dreaming and was actually awake when I was talking to this person or thing posing as my mum but... Who the hell was I actually talking to? Let me know what you guys think. When I was very little, like five or six I'd say, my dad used to take me on all sorts of adventures through nature, especially when we owned a little cottage up in the Scottish Highlands. Now, my dad is sort of a combo between a, an Irish bloke plus a Yorkshire laddie type of fellow and very spry despite his being about 55 at the time. And on this particular occasion, I decided that we were going to go hiking way up in the cliffs. I was quite happy with this development as it meant a piggyback ride for at least 90% of the difficult bits. This was a, a proper, proper trek too. He wanted to get to one of the highest bluffs so that we could have an amazing 360 degree view of the gorgeous meadows and some sparkling sea. But after we reached the top of the plains, where it's all short wind-whipped grass and you can see for miles, he suddenly turned very still and very quiet. But when you're small, your parents are like gods, so seeing your dad look frightened is scarier than anything your own mind can come up with. So I was pulling on his arm and going, what, what? But my mum is actually epileptic and I saw her fits when I was a kid so I thought it was happening to him too or something similar and I wouldn't know what to do because we're up on this huge cliff and no one is around. When just as fast as he started it, he snapped out of it. Fireman lifted me right up on his shoulder and just started striding away without a word. Over his shoulder though I could see a big yellow pale object stuck in the ground like a, an obelisk or something. I know now though that it was actually a refrigerator. When I was older and I asked my dad about it too, he just stiffened up and told me that when he was a boy in the 50s, he and his little friends had found an old style fridge in the woods and being little boys, they opened it. And well, of course, they had found a body. Another child who, by whichever means, had found themselves in the fridge and unable to get out. My dad has never mentioned a gender, which leads me to believe that he either witnessed a very decomposed or skeletonized individual, but I can't ask him. Remember that episode of The Simpsons where they unlock Homer's PTSD and it turns out that he found a dead body when he was a teenager? Well, my dad grew increasingly uncomfortable the first time that he saw that episode and had excused himself to the kitchen before the ending. My dad has seen some pretty gnarly shit in his life, but for whatever reason, he just will not discuss anything further about this dead child in the fridge, only that it happened. So when he explained, I assumed it was the trauma and I said something like, Oh dad, that's awful. So when you saw the fridge up there, it brought up all those old memories, right? And he honestly looked at me with his big blue eyes like I was an idiot. And I'll never forget what he said. No, Amy, he said in a very low tone. It was because it was the same fridge. I'd like to preface this by saying that I do not believe in ghosts. So I was walking through the woods after fishing for the better part of the day and I decided to stay out real late and try and fish up some bullheads from a local watering hole. I was only about 13 and stayed out way later than I normally would. 
Usually I would take a trail home, but decided to cut through some thicker brush to get to my grandparents' house so that I could call my mum. I knew that she'd probably be freaking out a bit, even though this happened from time to time. There was an abandoned graveyard on my route too. I don't remember what the story was about it, but I knew it was there. I had wandered past it before, never really checked it out. It's all just overgrown and wild anyway. And I knew that if I followed on the outskirts of the graveyard that I'd hit the road and be home free. The day had been pretty chill overall for my late spring day, but I swear in my teenage brain that it was just getting colder. I remember looking at my breath and thinking how weird it was that it hadn't gotten so cold. It was overall a pretty bright night, a near full moon, but in the woods it was really hard to see. The graveyard was wide open, no trees, and it was well lit. As I was walking up, I noticed that the ground was covered in a thin layer of fog and remember looking into the graveyard and not really registering what I saw at first. It was a person, which at first didn't seem odd, so I kept quiet and walked into the woods a bit more so I didn't get spotted. I didn't know who it was, so I just wanted to keep clear at this point. I stepped behind some of the trees and lost sight of them for a moment, and when I came back around the tree, they were just gone. Which was weird, because I was behind the tree for maybe a few seconds tops. I didn't hear anything, and I walk a bit further, keeping an eye out. And at this point, I must admit that I was a bit creeped out. Near the graveyard was a, a rundown, a barn of sorts, I suppose. I'm not really sure what it was, but as I got closer to it, I could see that someone was inside. I got a good look at them too, and it was a woman, probably in her 50s. The way the moonlight hit her made her look incredibly pale too. And strangely, she seemed to be digging, but I didn't hear anything. No sounds of a shovel or her making noise in any way, and... I was maybe 30 feet away, so I should have heard something. I could see that she stopped though, and then she just disappeared behind some debris. And at this point, I decided to get the heck out of there and quickly moved to get out of the road. I tried to keep track of her, looking for where she went, but I just couldn't find her. It was like she just literally disappeared. I kept trucking though and came out to the road... The fog was pretty much covering the road at this point, a small country road, fields on one side and woods on the other. As I walked down the road, she would just randomly appear in front of me at times, and I started hiding and basically playing cat and mouse with her. Each time I saw her, she was hard to see, only in the moonlight and stuck to the remnants of some of the old houses nearby. She always looked pale and just never made any noise. Once I got past the part of the road which had a number of barn foundations and home remnants, I never saw her again and it instantly started getting warmer. It creeped me out so much too that I just never went back that way again. I don't know who or what that was but I told my uncle about it and he went and checked it out, thinking that maybe someone was trying to excavate the graves. But when he got back he said that there wasn't anything messed with. And in the end, they thought that I was lying. It still gives me the shakes just typing this out because I know it was most likely someone wandering around looking for stuff or checking the place out. But what teenage me remembers just didn't seem natural. It was also weird that she just never made any noise. She also seemed to be able to just appear and move around me. At one point, she was right behind me and I swear a moment later that she was in front of me again. So we were out camping, but we were way out in the middle of nowhere on BLM land in Colorado. We drove for an hour and a half down a forest service road and didn't see another soul the whole time. And you could definitely see headlights and hear cars for miles away from our campsite. In other words, it's not like somebody could have just snuck up unnoticed. So we had three cars with us and eight people. Just got done eating, cleaned up, it was getting dark so we went to the cars real quick before hitting our tents for the night. And somebody had slashed the front tire on each of the three cars with what appeared to be a box cutter. Everyone thought it was a prank but it became very apparent quickly that it wasn't. 
All of us were beyond spooked, like panicking a bit, scary to watch spooked. We all had spares and one dude had a gun, so we threw on our donuts while the guy literally guarded us and then we just got the hell out of there. I still have nightmares about it sometimes though, just knowing that there was some person probably watching us, maybe wanting to even harm us, just standing out there in the darkness. And it makes me feel physically ill to this day. My dad and I went hiking a few days ago, and my dad is a waterfall fanatic. He wants to see as many as possible in his life. So, he and I are hiking along a very pretty trail. We're hiking along a river, it's flowing nicely. There's mountains all around us. The trail is weaving around these big beautiful boulders. I'm hiking at most 30 feet ahead of him, I'd say, looking for a spot to stop and have a sit down for a picnic lunch, and as I rounded a blind curve in the trail, I just freeze. Sitting on a stump, maybe 10 feet off to the right of the trail, is a guy. But he's wearing one of those colourful Baja hoodies with the hood pulled up and a half mask with rabbit ears. He sees me and stands up right as my dad rounds the corner. We're all three sizing each other up in silence and my dad addresses him. Hey, what's up buddy? The masked man tips his head as if he was deciding what to do with us. And then he says back, Not much, man. You aren't the guys I'm waiting for. Have a good day. Then he turns and jogs off quickly into the woods. Strapped on his lower back was a large hunting knife and he also had a pistol on his hip. We lost sight of him pretty quickly. We hadn't seen a soul on the trail all day and we'd been hiking for almost three hours. Needless to say, we left the waterfall for another day and just quickly turned around. Once we were off the trail, we reported it to the local forest service and the police, but they said that they couldn't do much aside from keep an eye out for any suspicious activity. The masked guy didn't have a backpack or water or pretty much anything, which makes me think that he either stashed it somewhere or was maybe camping and waiting nearby. I hate to admit it, but I desperately wanted to go after the guy and ask who he was actually waiting for and why. This story starts around the fall of 2017. I was walking back to work from lunch when I passed this girl and noticed she got up and started walking behind me. She took a different route and didn't follow me, but a few days later, it happened again, but this time, she was definitely following me. I assumed that she was just following me at the time because where my office building is situated, you have to go up a set of stairs and pass a few other buildings and she didn't follow me into the building. But after a while, I noticed we took the same train home too, and a lot of the time she would be watching me. When we made eye contact, she would always look away, but then she continued looking at me when she thought that I wasn't looking. There's a Whole Foods across from my office too, and I went there for lunch a couple of times during the week. I started seeing this girl sitting in the window for lunch, and she would almost always get up as soon as I left and walk the same way I did. Around this time, I began seeing her more frequently too. During lunchtime or when I got to the metro, she was always just there. After a couple of months of this, I started noticing that she would get off at the same station as me sometimes. Sometimes, she would walk the same way as me too. But once I got to my place, I live in a condo with my brother, she would always pass by but never follow me up to the entrance. During this time, I started receiving phone calls at work from random phone numbers that, at the time, I assumed were spam. There would either be silence on the end or the person would just hang up immediately. I also started receiving fake Facebook requests from people that I already knew or was already on my friends list. December 2017 comes and by this time, I'm not going to the Whole Foods as often. If she gets off at the same station as me, I go into a restaurant or go shopping for groceries before I go home. Around this time, an old friend that I went to high school with contacts me kind of out of the blue as well. She said that she wanted to follow me on Instagram and we text a couple of times and I accept a follow request. She contacts me again about a month later from a different number, but this time she's texting me frequently. 
and I'm talking just about every day or every other day. I'm not one to be mean or show when I'm annoyed too often, but after months of this, when she asks if she's texting me too frequently, I don't hesitate to tell her that she could lay off a bit. She stops for a week or so, then starts texting frequently again. This whole ordeal, I know, should have sent red flags up for several reasons. But during this time, she would ask me so many random questions, like when you would do when you're trying to get to know someone. She would ask for selfies, which I declined because I don't like taking pictures of myself. And I would tell her that there are plenty of pictures of me on Facebook. She would ask what I'm doing on the weekends and the names of my friends on occasion, which I wouldn't tell her because I thought it was weird that she'd want to know my friends' names. I only sent her a couple of videos of fun things that I do, but that was pretty much it. August of 2018 rolls around eventually, and I am still seeing Creepy Girl everywhere during the week. Eventually, I get pulled into my boss's office. He says that a few co-workers received fake screenshots from Facebook of me talking badly about them. Now, I never post on Facebook and would never talk shit about my co-workers on social media. I don't have a grudge with any of them, and nor do I know anyone who has a problem with me. I'm a fairly easygoing guy, and I managed to clear things up with everyone involved and still had my job by the end of it. Of course, my friend is still texting me fairly frequently, and I tell her what happened a couple of days later when I got home from work. I tell her that I don't want to get too much into it, but she keeps pushing for more details. I finally told her that I was just going to go to bed, and she got the message. But the more I thought about all the time she texted me, though, the more uneasy I got about the whole thing. Some things that she just said just didn't make sense, especially from the way I remember her. We kept in touch over the years, though, but just not as frequently, and we hadn't touched base for a while before I heard from her in December. A couple of weeks later, I decided to reach out to my friend on Instagram. But the Instagram that she had last messaged me through, it just wasn't there. However, there was still an Instagram for her that I followed and that follows me back. I reach out to her and ask what her phone number was, and the phone number is completely different. And it turns out that she was never the one texting me, nor did she request following me on Instagram. I eventually track the number, and it turns out to be from one of those fake phone number apps. I request to be blocked from the service, and I never hear from my friend again. After talking about it with my brother and a couple of friends, I'm almost 100% certain that it was the girl that's been following me. These things only started after she appeared too, with the phone calls to my office, the fake Facebook requests, etc. A few days before I was pulled aside by my boss too, my friend texted me and told me that she had a weird feeling about me and wanted to make sure that I was okay. I just thought that she was being weird at the time and didn't think too much of it. This whole ordeal is really scary though when I look back on it because I sent videos of myself and even my address at one point to my friend. And my friend even confirmed a post that my brother made with pictures that he tagged of me on Facebook. I was texting a stranger for eight months about my life and they also apparently have access to my Facebook page. I still see this girl from time to time since she obviously works in the same area as me. She doesn't follow me around as much but when she does see me on the metro, she always watches me or sits somewhere that she'll be able to make eye contact with me. I'm always careful now if anyone texts me from an unrecognizable phone number and I'm just paranoid. I know that this story is just a bit all over the place, especially with the conclusion that I came to of the girl posing as my friend, but I just had to get this off my chest. And also, I would love to know what you guys think I should do next. So this just happened uh, an hour or two ago, and I'm pretty freaked out. I have a Wi-Fi enabled baby monitor in my bedroom so we can watch my 5 month old son when he's sleeping in his bassinet when my husband and I are downstairs. I tend to be nude when I'm in my bedroom in the second story of my house as I don't have central air and it's summer in Wisconsin USA and today is currently over 80 degrees. 
I was laying in bed drinking a beer and watching TV when I noticed the light blinking on the baby monitor, which was currently facing toward the bed as my son had been in a co-sleeper on the bed with my husband last night. I work overnight shifts in a hospital. But for our monitor, a, a light blinking on it means that someone is watching via the website or app for the monitor. I jokingly sent a text calling my husband a creeper and was flipping off the camera and talking to it, but found it odd that it took him several minutes to read my message. He was at work at this time, but when he finally responded, I could say the cliche that my blood ran cold, but that would be embellishing. He said that he hadn't opened the app for the camera in weeks and definitely wasn't the one watching, and advised that I unplug the camera, which I did. I don't know who was watching me or how they could have gotten a hold of the login info for the monitor, but it was pretty creepy, that's for sure. Fifteen years ago, I had the misfortune of meeting Dave. I was new to riding the bus to school and when my first day came, I hopped on and took a seat towards the front. I didn't happen to know anyone on the route and sat by myself with my headphones in, rocking some now classic Good Charlotte. Back then, I didn't get much attention from the opposite sex, but I could just feel eyes burning into the back of my head. I turned a couple of times to look behind me and that's when I saw Dave. He had light eyes, brown curly hair and quickly looked away every time I caught him staring. This went on for about a week before he finally said something to me. He told me that I had nice hair and he liked my band t-shirts. He asked right off the bat if I would be his girlfriend and I said absolutely not. I didn't even know him and his creepy staring made me so uncomfortable. He brushed past my quick no though and told me that there was a newly instituted hug toll that needed to be paid before getting on and off the bus. I just kind of stared at him as he blocked the center aisle and gave him a half-hearted one-armed hug. I know, I know. Why would you hug the guy when you felt like he was a creep? Well, I had pointed him out to a few people in school and everyone I talked to said that he was the nicest person they'd ever met and just a bit of an odd duck. But back then, I was worried about hurting anyone's feelings or being seen as rude, so I just went with it. I mean, I have brothers on the spectrum and maybe he was too or something. But the next thing I know... Dave had joined my photography classes, my after school programs and I saw him around every corner and in every hallway of the school. He started popping up from behind things to try and hug and tickle me and meanwhile everyone just kept going on with the chorus of he's a super sweet guy and just an odd duck bullshit. But when I found out that he was telling people that I was his girlfriend, I knew that I needed to put my foot down at this point. It was around this time that I became unwilling to pay the hug toll and feed his delusions. And that was when things really took a turn. Suddenly, anonymous notes were popping up in my locker. But most of the notes said always and nothing else. Some had longer declarations of love, but the always ones got me the most. But the simplicity of the message gave me chills. Always. I knew it had to be Dave though, and my suspicions were confirmed when pictures of me began showing up along with the notes. The pictures were always taken from a slight distance and clearly without my knowledge. They were black and white and developed on the same type of paper that we used in photo class, and I knew that it had to be Dave. I mean, who else would be doing this? I finally got scared though one Saturday afternoon as I was watching TV in my bed, because... I heard Dave's voice next to my bedroom window. He said that he watched me walk home one day to see where I lived and wanted to stop by for a visit. He said that he knew I wouldn't let him in so he figured he'd just stop by the window to talk. And how he knew which window was mine was a thought that chilled me even more. The way that this was escalating I knew I needed to get the adults involved at this point. My mum thought that I was exaggerating. He was just young and infatuated and hormonal according to her. She acknowledged the notes and the pictures as weird but nothing other than some serious infatuation. So I went to an instructor at the school I knew that I could talk to and laid it all out on the table. 
Mr. K had also had Dave as a student and noticed some of his quirks and obsessive behavior and didn't doubt my story for a moment. He spoke to Dave's guidance counselor and they both sat down with Dave and I assume told him that he was making me uncomfortable and to stop. And this pissed Dave right off. He stormed up to me in the lobby of the school with a glass rose in his hand and threw it at the wall behind me. It shattered and he screamed in my face about how I'd broken his heart just like the rose. A few teachers broke up the situation and a few days later he dropped out of the school and I went eight years without actually seeing Dave. Eight years later I was craving some mac and cheese as one does and I hit up a popular spot in town to grab some to go. I looked behind the counter and there's Dave. I had no idea that he was working there and debated leaving for a moment. I decided to stay in line to get some food though. High school was a long time ago after all. I hadn't heard from him since that day in the lobby. But surely this guy could not still have this obsession with me. And it was a huge relief when another register opened and a young woman would take my order. I honestly wondered at the time if maybe he was even more mortified and didn't want to interact with me at all and had her open for that reason. But I was wrong again. He seemed to take my visit to his work as a sign that I was actually ready to love him. At least that's what I've been told since then. I got a friend request from him that night and immediately deleted the request. A few nights later, I'm getting home and walking across the street when... I see that someone is standing on the side of my house, opposite the door in the shadows. Well, I haul ass into the house, lock everything, and watch. It's really dark out, but I turn on the lamppost out front and hope to God that I was just imagining things. But then, I see him. He slinks from the side of the house, trying to stay in the shadows, and runs across the street and towards the house that he grew up in. Unfortunately for him, I saw his stupid curly brown hair. I called the police and reported this, but of course there wasn't much that they could do. But there was no proof. He hadn't approached me or tried to get in. It couldn't be proven it was him too, and they did agree to keep someone on the lookout in the area, and I saw police patrolling more than usual the following night. Eventually, the police patrol died down, and that's when the late night knocking began. I could hear it softly on the windows and occasionally on the back door, but never dared to answer or get close enough to look. It wasn't every night, maybe two or three nights a week I'd say. The police never seemed to be close enough in the area when it happened to catch him either, so that was pretty unfortunate. A couple of weeks after the knocking began though, I received an envelope wedged into my screen door. It was full of creepy candid pictures from high school and another note that said always... And at this point, I had had enough and didn't know what to do. I went out to my car to drive everything down to the police. I don't care if I couldn't prove it was him. I just wanted to have some official record of what was happening to me. And that was when I saw the word, always, carved into my back bumper. And I lost it. I just broke down in heavy sobs as I drove to the police station. And again, all they could do was take a report. But I decided on another course of action. In my rage, I took a picture of the police station sign and of the report being filed. I sent them to Dave over Facebook Messenger. I told him to leave me the hell alone, that the police were involved and he didn't want to ruin his life in this way. And he simply responded, you're right, and disappeared. I've since heard that he stalked a widow shortly after her husband had died, pounded at her windows and doors trying to break in until she screamed out of the top window that she was calling the police. I can only begin to imagine how she felt trying to grieve her husband and deal with Dave's obsessive ways at the same time. You may now find yourself wondering if the mac and cheese was worth it, and the answer is definitely not. It was nowhere near warm enough and also came with the side of Stalker. I was walking around my neighborhood alone once, enjoying the night air and watching the stars. There was this little pond near my house with a wooded area that had trees, a bench and a rope swing that went out over the water and whatnot. 
I sat down on the bench to look at the stars and I heard some rustling off to my right towards the trees. But bears were not uncommon where I'm from so I took out my flashlight and shone it around over there and I didn't see anything. It obviously freaked me out, so I kept my flashlight on and my senses aware, but I stayed on the bench to mull over my thoughts and watch the sky some more. Honestly, I don't know why I did that too, because that's some pretty typical horror movie shit right there. Anyway, I had a few minutes pass and I hear nothing, so I lean back onto the porch and start to relax a bit. I'm staring up at the sky with my flashlight pointed downwards so as not to create any light pollution when... I noticed something in the tree in my peripheral vision. I couldn't tell what it was, but the branch was swaying lightly and the rustling noise was back too. I immediately sat up and stared at it, but hadn't shone my flashlight at it yet in case of pissing off some huge bird or something else. And quite frankly, I don't think I've ever been that scared. I remember my heart was beating so fast and I could taste blood. I stared at it for what seemed like forever and it slowly stopped moving, but the shape was still there. Bears do climb trees sometimes, so I was hesitant to run away in case that was it, so I just kept staring at it. After a while, I mustered up the little raisinous kahunis to shine my fucking light at the tree and it was a man. A fucking man in the tree, crouched in the tree like some silent naked monkey. He had no expression on his face, but his eyes were open really, really wide. When my light landed on him, he started to move like he was going to come down, but I didn't stick around to see if he did. I jumped the bench and just ran for the hills. I ran to my house, around to the back door, and locked myself in without looking back once. I went around and made sure every window and door was locked, and I even checked the attic. And these days, I try not to go out alone anymore. Before I start, I want to make it clear that I really don't know what happened to you. I don't know if it was something paranormal or just a really creepy dude, but I wanted to share it anyway. So this happened to me back when I was 16 years old. It was summer and I was spending my days out at a family's home in the countryside. My father always gave me a lot of freedom, so I was used to taking long strolls in the heart of the night. It's a rather small town and I know most of the residents. I never had a reason to be scared. It was around 2am and I was talking on the phone to a friend and jokingly I said that I was going to jump the graveyard's fence and take a look around. I was kind of determined to do it I must admit but my phone's battery died halfway through and I didn't feel like going on without my friend talking to me so I decided it was time to go back home and I took a shortcut. Now, I know this sounds very cliche, right? Taking the dark shortcut instead of going through the civilized world and stuff like that, but you have to understand the situation. It was something that I was extremely used to, and as I said, nothing dangerous ever happened in that town. Now, this shortcut is a two-kilometer road built on the side of the mountain that became a pedestrian area after a section of it collapsed under the weight of a truck. After this event, all the lampposts were dismantled as well, so using a flashlight is pretty much mandatory. So after a few minutes of walking, I started hearing someone whistling, and being late at night and on a remote road, I accelerated the pace. It followed me for a good amount of time, and every time I turned my head to see if I could spot a flashlight, I couldn't find anything. But going around without a flashlight can make you fall in the ravine, so this was really odd. Then, it stopped. I stopped walking too to check if it was still following, whoever it was. And that was when I heard rustling within the bushes. The year before this, I had a frightening experience with a boar on that same road. So, I turned off the flashlight and tried to stand completely still without making any sound. And, the classic click of a camera and the flash came out from the bushes. And that was when I lost it. I ran until I was out of breath and still I wasn't near the end of the road. I took a couple of seconds to relax because my heart was going to explode and I turned to face the woods. I stopped right in front of the pathway, but before I even realized that I was very exposed, I heard quick footsteps coming at me from that small path, so I ran again, but this time I didn't stop until I was home. After that, nothing really spooky ever happened again. 
I didn't find a picture of myself on my threshold, no creepy figures stalked me in the night, nothing came out from the woods. I actually didn't tell my father about this in fear that he would restrict my freedom too, and I'm glad that nothing frightening actually happened afterwards. Otherwise, I wouldn't have had the courage to go back to my family home every year. Sometimes I go on night strolls on that road still, but never without a friend or a relative with me since that day. So all these things happened over a span of three years that I lived there beginning in 2012. My childhood friend from years back asked me if I would be a roommate. I needed out of my parents' home at the time and she needed a roommate so it seemed like a good situation. Nestled in a suburban area was this cabin. The cabin dates back to sometime in the 1700s we think. The road that the cabin is off of bears the same name as the original family of the house too. But they owned a large portion of the land that is now one of the largest cities in the US. But search American Colonial Cabin and you'll see a swath of images that it looks like. But we originally think that it was used as slave quarters as this is a tobacco country and then later found out that it was a stable house. The stable house theory checks out as our dog dug up a horseshoe once and I actually still have that horseshoe. So, the night we moved in, I just knew the place was eerie. But there were no doors to the upstairs, my room, no doors to the downstairs bedroom. Her bedroom was an addition that someone added on in the late 80s. The previous owners also added a much-needed kitchen and bathroom as the original layout did not have either. And now that you've got a decent imagery of what I was working with, I'll start with the posting. So when moving in, like I said, I immediately felt a feeling of just being watched. The house always felt dark and cold and moist, much like a cellar if I had to compare it to something. It was par for the course with that type of house, but there was just something else about it. And it all started with scratching. Every night I would be in bed and I would wake up to this scratching directly underneath my bed by my head. At first, I thought it was mice, obviously, but when I listened to it long enough, I realized that the scratching was a long, drawn-out one, like a foot-long pull. Then, it repeated. I just covered my head in the end, muffled my ears, and closed my eyes. I was a 23-year-old man, by the way, and I felt like I was cowering, but I was not about to tussle with wood-scratching spirits, that was for sure. Alright, so one night I heard it start, and normally I would have been asleep, but this time I was up late and I heard it. It started on the ceiling on the far side of my room, and then it went back down the hall. And then, it scratched its way to directly underneath me. After a while, the scratching went across the room and back to the wall, and then it was just gone. And here is how I know that it definitely wasn't mice. My walls were solid wood, as the inside logs were the same as the outside. The floor had no space between the ceiling below and the floor above. Uh, like I said, it was an old cabin. Obviously, I got pretty scared by this and started sleeping downstairs at this point. The roommate, now my wife, asked what was up and I told her. She said the same stuff was going on when she was home alone too, and this was in the very first week that we got there. But... Here's the creepy part. So when we moved in, I had to unscrew all of the screws that the previous renter had put into the windows. I had to unscrew one of the exterior doors that he screwed shut. But we had to clean out the weird rabbit food, we think, from the oven. And we had to write, doesn't live here, on hundreds of mail order catalogs the previous renter received. We always joked that the guy was a shut-in Satanist or something, but nowadays... I don't think that we were probably too far off in the end. But we both started sleeping downstairs in the living room and felt comfortable in numbers. But the eerie feeling was easier to deal with if someone was with you. And that was until one night. So I had a dream that a dark force was approaching me. It was in third person as if I was watching myself sleep. The entity starts looming over my head and all the while I feel a pressure building in my head and a high pitch ringing in my ears. It got so intense that I sprung up from my sleep and looked around the room. About a second later, the TV shut off, just cut off by itself. 
We had been having problems with the TV randomly turning on and off, but this time was just far too coincidental to be brushed off like everything else. Also, I knew that I went to bed with the TV turned off. I mean, I cut it off personally, so why was it on in the first place? We started sleeping in her room after that night. She told me that nothing really happens in her room, which is why we chose to do that. Maybe because it was an addition or something? I don't know, but... Well, our ghost played matchmaker, and now we're trying for a kid. Married for five years. Anywho, once I was upstairs reading, and as I was falling asleep, my window just started opening and shutting by itself. I was already at my wit's end with these spirits, so the next day I set up the same situation, same thing, and it's funny how it never does that when I'm not in there. I ended up yelling and telling it to just leave us alone, and I was tired of its shit, and holy smokes, it kind of worked, for a while at least. Then, when I was home alone, clocks started going off as soon as my wife would leave. Drawers would open and there was banging on the front door and just everything. Then, over time, it just stopped, slowed down and ultimately nothing. I guess as I matured there that it just stopped messing with me. Today, my in-laws live there. They were my landlords and the home is cute, homely and warm. I spend time there alone and I don't feel any malice at all. It was a weird experience and I would do it all over again if I had to. I'm open to questions but this, I swear to you, is 100% real and I can give further details if needed. So I've been a career paramedic but this happened when I'd only been one for about 5 years. This has never left me to this day, and I shit you not, it happened exactly like this. So, I was driving home on a rural highway one rainy afternoon. It was really pouring, and traffic had slowed to about 50 miles per hour. I was following two vehicles, and we rounded a bend into the road as a small sports car on the opposite side crossed the center line and hit the small SUV that was leading the three of us vehicles on my side of the road. I immediately pulled over and called 911 because it was a bad one. I got out to check on everyone and there was wailing coming from the SUV on the side of the road. That was always a good thing because people are breathing if you know they're screaming so I went down into the field past the ditch to check on the sports car. There were two young guys in the car and the force of the impact had driven the engine to where the front passenger seat should be. The passenger was still buckled, his crumpled hand grabbing the oh shit handle overhead, the entire section of the car shoved into the back seat area. The back of the car had peeled away, as had the passenger's top of his head. His jawbone was jutted out raw and jagged, he was clearly deceased, but I felt for a pulse anyway, all while listening to the gasping and ragged dragging breaths of the driver. There was no pulse on the passenger, so I tried to figure out how to deal with the driver, but there was really nothing I could do. The car had literally wrapped around him, and it would take an extrication team time to get him out. Listening to his dying breathing, I apologized out loud to him that I couldn't do more, told him that I was sorry to leave him, but others needed my help too. In my heart, I knew that he would never make it, so I went to render aid where I was needed. In triage, we call this black tagging, a patient who isn't going to survive. I did what I could for the family in the SUV. Emergency medical people and fire services got to the scene and took over. The entire family had injuries, but all survived, thankfully. Unfortunately, though, the mother had permanent brain damage and even lost an eye. But the whole day, those two guys that were in the red sports car just stayed on my mind. That night, I was home alone getting ready for bed with just the bedside lamp on, and I heard something in the hallway. It got louder as it came closer down the dark hallway toward my open door. It was like a a thump and then a drag, and a thump and a drag again. And I absolutely froze. A broken hand curled around the frame of my doorway, and then that kid from the passenger seat was standing there, busted up like he was in the car. He looked at me and I can't recall the exact words of what he said but it was something along the lines of 
hey, my friend wants you to know that he understands. He wants you to know that he's okay. Well, we both are. Thanks for trying. He stood there for a few more seconds, just looking at me. And then he stepped back into the shadows, let go of the doorframe, and I listened to him drag back down the hallway and into nothing. I, obviously, turned on every damn light that I could. I slept with the lights on for two full weeks after that, and I clipped out their death notices from the paper later that week. Turns out that they were both high school seniors on their way home from a wrestling tournament. Their car apparently hyperplaned from what the investigation determined. I had never had recognized the blonde-headed kid had he come to me as his healthy, unwrecked self. It freaked me the hell out that he came to me busted up like that and I still have the newspaper clippings and I will never forget them, nor that ghastly visit that night. This story takes place at a mall where the establishment had just built a cute rubber playground. At the time I was six years old and was simply enjoying playing at the area as my family was shopping only a few feet away. But then came a wrinkly looking tanned man with a long beard, skinny and baldy. He approached a small Latino boy and began talking to him about cool toys that he had in his van. Now, at this time I knew what stranger danger meant, but to my shame, I only stood there, shocked that this was all happening. More so too when this boy was agreeing to follow him where he kept his toys. I remember thinking, oh my goodness, this boy is really going with this man. Doesn't he know what stranger danger is? If that didn't make things worse, the boy was so excited that he went ahead to invite his brother, around the same age as I am, and they went off together. I honestly didn't know what I could do, run off into this giant mall after them and get lost, tell my mum what was going on, would she even believe me? Where were their parents anyway? But as I stood there, watching them walk off together into the distance... So did the opportunity. I stopped playing and walked into the store where my mum was and told her in a shy voice what happened. I was struggling to find the words, but I told her something along the lines of, Hey mummy, I saw something strange happen. I saw an ugly old man walk off with two boys, like the kind of men you warned me about on the news. She just looked at me and smiled, not seeming to entirely understand what I was saying. I pressed the issue more so, but she only responded... Don't worry, mummy is almost done shopping for shoes. She proceeded to shower me with compliments in the kind of tone mums reserve for when they're playfully talking to babies. But this only made me more distressed. I could feel the time to act slipping away and I remember telling her, I'm serious, there was a creepy man over there talking to children. I pointed at the direction where they once stood and I remember watching her face attentively and saw a flicker of understanding, but she just brushed it off as doubt settled in. And that was the end of that encounter. A few days later, I was watching the news with my mum, and I saw the same boys. I felt placed on the spotlight again on what to do, but I knew my mum would never take me seriously. I was only six, and my family were illegals who wouldn't want to involve themselves with the police anyway. I asked my mum what she thought about those two boys, but she had no opinion because she wasn't paying attention to the TV anyway. I must admit that I often look back with regret of what I could have done. The parents may teach their kids what to do when these incidents happen to them, but I don't know what I could have done as a witness. I felt as if I'd done what I could do telling my mum, but I was just too young in her eyes to be taken seriously. Honestly... I hate that playground and I never ended up playing there after that incident. I'm 21 now but I still see parents dropping off their kids there and shop around the area. And just what a dumb place to have anyway as it only encourages so much negligence. So I have a few events that have happened throughout my childhood and a small amount throughout my adult life. I thought I'd share some with you as they've suddenly popped back into my mind. The first story involved my brothers and sisters and our first real experience with something unusual. So, I was about 8 or 9, I'm currently 22, and I was playing Cat in the Hat for the Xbox original. 
My sisters came home late around, one or two I think, and were hanging out with me and watching me play the game in my living room. But we only had one TV. And on the final level of the boss fight, my brother comes home drunk. Also, my mum worked nights at the time, so she was gone till 5am. And started to yell at us to shut up and go to sleep because he was tired. As we tried to explain to him the game was almost done, he kept getting louder and louder until finally the game and the TV shut off on their own. And the kitchen light just went on full blast to 100% brightness. Our kitchen light switch was and still is a knob and it had about three full rotations to max brightness. My brother immediately shut up and left into the other family room and just sat there where as me and my sisters just looked at each other wondering what the hell happened. Nobody was near the light knob at the time and everyone was spooked as hell. After that night strange stuff began to happen while I was home alone constantly as well. As I got older, my sisters and brothers began going out more at night to do stuff like partying and whatnot, and I was still young and I would watch TV by myself until about midnight on weeknights. It would just be me and my dog watching Toonami, waiting for our favourite show to come on. The TV is in the main living room, closer to the hallways, with the bedrooms and the family room is near the front door and had our computer, a piano and an old coffee table. We still have that coffee table and piano in fact. As I would be watching anime late at night by myself, I would hear footsteps in our attic at night. And I honestly thought that I was hallucinating, or maybe I was paranoid, but when my dog hears it too and begins to growl at my ceiling, you basically feel pretty fucked. I would shrug it off like maybe it was a raccoon or a possum on the roof or something, but shit got real when the computer monitor turned on by itself at 12am at night, and I began hearing the keys on the keyboard clicking. I knew that I was by myself too because I made it a routine to check every room and make sure everything was okay and locked before I would go into my living room. I was self-conscious about my anime as a kid. Hearing keys click, I hid under my blanket and held my dog as he perked his ears up on alert of the sound. I went into the family room to investigate after I turned on all the lights in the house and all the windows were double locked with the button lock and the steel pole thing was in place as a failsafe. Also, my garage door and my front door were both double locked and chained. Nobody was there. The computer didn't turn on, it was just the monitor and the sound of the keys clicking and I quickly turned off the monitor and I just left at that point. When I turned 15, my mum switched to day shifts instead of night shifts so my schedule got tight. I was in bed by 8 and up by 7 and to be honest I kind of miss it. Fast forward though to now and I'm 22 and I'm still into gaming where I built my own PC and got a whole bunch of fancy stuff for it. I have a Corsair Strafe with Cherry MX Blues, yes the really loud and clicky ones. But my gaming PC is in my room about 4 feet away from my bed as well. And one night I was up late texting the bay around 1am and I swear to god that someone started clicking my fucking keyboard. And... All those memories instantly came back and I started crying as I turned on my phone flashlight to see if someone was in my room. My little brother likes to joke around and play pranks and whatnot so I thought maybe he hid in my room or snuck in while I was just texting but I didn't see anyone there. I got up to check under and around my bed and around my closet to see if I could find anything or anyone. But my bed doesn't have an under part because it's a two piece with drawers under it anyway but... There's absolutely zero space under my bed and my closet is just a cut out space in my room with a pole for hangers. In other words, there was just nowhere to hide except for on the side of the bed. After I calmed down, I opened my door to call my girlfriend and tell her what happened. She's horrified of supernatural things so I kind of kept it brief. I keep her on the phone and close my door and shut off my light. I'm wide awake on the phone with her and... Then I hear my spacebar key get pushed four times in rapid succession, like someone was mashing it. I ask my girlfriend if she heard it and I hold the phone closer to the desk and the space key clicks again. Obviously, I didn't sleep in my room that night. Every now and then I still hear stuff in my attic but it's full of fiber and shit and I don't like going up there. Plus, it's a huge pain in the ass. However, the times I do go up there, they're isn't anything at all and it just really bothers me. 
I would honestly feel better if there was some old dude living up there who was just messing with me so that I could call the cops and get it sorted. But unfortunately, that's just not the case. I always leave my car unlocked. Always. No matter where it is, no matter what I'm doing, no matter how long I'll be, it's always unlocked. The reason for this is because I used to live in a really bad neighborhood, but there were always robberies and just break-ins and everything. Now, back then, I was a broke-ass college kid. I didn't have shit for anyone to steal, but I noticed that some people were getting their windows smashed in on their cars when people were breaking in. But when I asked around, they told me that the cars with the smashed windows were locked, and so I left my car unlocked. If they wanted to waste their time looking through it, that's on them. I always kept my car unlocked and never kept any valuables in it. A few times, it was rummaged through for sure, but I always just cleaned the mess up and moved on. But fast forward to now though, and I had a closing shift at work uh, about a week ago I'd say. I'm a librarian, so I get off at about 9 during closing shifts. Not bad, and we all walk out and lock up together. There are two parking lots at my library, one in the front where the books are and one in the back where the labs or computers are. Most employees park in the back, but this time I chose to park in the front. I said goodbye to everyone and headed to my car alone. When I reached it, I grabbed the handle and pulled, but it wouldn't open. For a few seconds, I was really confused, but then it hit me. My doors were locked. Instantly, I was unsettled. I had the feeling that I was being watched. I don't know why, too. Maybe it was just the weirdness of knowing that I hadn't locked the door or something. I looked around, though, checked my back seat, unlocked it, and jumped in. I started it and tore out of the parking lot, and when I hit the main road home, there was traffic. It wasn't a lot, given the time, but it was still pretty slow and kept stopping. And I just could not shake this creeping feeling that I still had, but I just brushed it off. I reasoned with myself that I just watched too many horror movies. But then, as I stopped at a light, I heard a loud screech and a thump. My trunk had just come open. I waited until I got to a well-lit area to stop, and I pulled into the parking lot of a gas station, shaking. I made sure that there were people around and practically tiptoed to my trunk. Nothing was in there, but a few of my things looked like they'd been moved to make a person-sized spot. After this, I think I might start locking my car after all.